Good afternoon. I would like to um, call this meeting to order. Um, welcome to the Assembly Committee on Revenue. And I would ask Madam Secretary to the, take the roll call. Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Cohen. Present. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Gallant. Here. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblyman Hafen. Here. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Assemblyman Wynn. Assemblyman O'Neill, no. Assemblyman Orntlicker, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, Present. Chair Bacchus. Present. I hope you heard me. Um, go ahead. Um, I'm present, and I would also say please mark um, Assemblyman Orlichter present when he arrives. With that, welcome everybody. Um, today is going to be a full meeting. Um, due to a lot of bills being introduced in other committees, we are going to take ours out of order and do the best we can do today. With that, we're first going to start with Assembly Bill 359. Ideally, we'd like to move to ACR 7 um, and then go to AB 445 and conclude this evening with AB 430. However, um, with other members having to present in other committees, we have to be a little flexible today, so we will do our best. With that, we'll go ahead and open the hearing on Assembly B Bill 359, revising provisions relating to the imposition by certain counties of additional taxes on fuels for motor vehicles. I'd like to um, welcome Assemblyman Watts and the other presenters this evening. Feel free to commence when you are ready. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Howard Watts, representing Assembly District 15 in the heart of Clark County. We'll do our best to keep this moving for you. And uh, flexibility is important. Uh, with that, uh, joining me today with, uh, to help present this bill are Danny Thompson on behalf of uh, Labor and MJ Maynard with the RTC of Southern Nevada, uh, the CEO. And also joining us via Zoom is Clark County Commissioner uh, and RTC Board Chairman Justin Jones. Um, so a, a little bit of background on uh, this issue. In 2015, through the passage of Assembly Bill 191, the legislature placed a question on the 2016 general election ballot in Clark County seeking approval for a 10-year extension of an indexed fuel tax, which was originally approved in a previous session. Uh, as you may recall, uh, the question was approved by 56.28% of voters. And with that approval, um, the people of Clark County agreed to pay higher taxes in order to devote billions of dollars to local road construction, maintenance, and repair projects. Under current law, uh, for Clark County to be able to continue this indexing after that 10-year period ends on December 31st, 2026, an additional question would be required to be placed on the ballot in November of 2026, asking voters whether to authorize the uh, county to impose the indexing moving forward. Um, uh, and if that was approved, it would continue from January 1st, 2027, with no uh, end date uh, prescribed. Uh, so with that, um, uh, indefinite continuation, that would be the same as the current indexing um, uh, mechanism in Washoe County. Uh, again, I know fuel taxes are a bit complicated uh, with state portions, local portions. Um, certain things have been uh, acted upon, particularly indexing in Washoe County and Clark County, not in other counties. Um, but uh, as it stands, uh, Clark County would need to approve an additional ballot question in order to continue indexing in 2027 and beyond. If that question was not approved, then the indexing calculations and increases uh, would end with the rates established on July 1st, 2026. Um, but those rates would not be affected uh, or eliminated and would continue um, for any period during which bonds are outstanding that are secured by those index tax rates. So that brings us to the bill at hand, Assembly Bill 359, which you have before you today. 
instead of requiring the approval of a majority of the voters in the county to continue to provide for those annual increases on and after uh, January 1st, 2027, the bill would authorize continued increases in these taxes consistent with the indexing that we've had uh, so far if the Clark County Board of uh, County Commissioners on or before the end of 2026 adopted an ordinance authorizing the annual increases. Uh, and then if they did not do so, they would be prohibited from imposing any additional annual increases or indexing to those taxes. So uh, that at, at the highest level is what the bill seeks to do. Um, you know, figuring out how we provide sustainable funding for our transportation system, our roadway network is of critical importance. It's uh, an issue that has uh, become worse over time. We've seen an erosion in funding uh, for some of these programs. In some cases, it's because the the way that they're set up is is not able to keep up with our our growing economy and community. When it comes to fuel taxes, they've been eroded by increasing vehicle efficiency throughout the fleet, um, including the use of alternative uh, fuel vehicles. Um, and they've been eroded by uh, inflation. Uh, and uh, this uh, seeks to make sure that we don't slip back any further. This is one of the uh, one of the items that came out of uh, a working group uh, spearheaded by Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno, who is the lead sponsor of this bill. Um, and uh, I am uh, honored to present it on her behalf today. So with that, I'll uh, turn things over to Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Chairman Watts. For the record, Danny Thompson, uh, today I'm representing the Operating Engineers Local 12 uh, IBW Local 396 and Labor's Local 872 in support of the fuel revenue indexing. Uh, I'm also the vice chairman of the Transportation Resource Advisory Committee, or TRAC, and I know that there, a number of the members of the committee are here. I know chairman, our chairman, Warren Hardy, is here today in support of this bill. You know, uh, for those of you from Clark County, you know the problem, and you know that the solution is not easy. You know, our, our, our funding is broken down to three main sources. The motor vehicle fuel tax, sales tax collected in Clark County, and the fuel revenue indexing. Uh, this issue has already went before a vote of the people and a vote of the county commission, where it passed overwhelmingly. And, you know, it's critical if we're going to maintain our infrastructure uh, in southern Nevada that we have this because if this failed and I chairman watch just mentioned the, you know the the problems we've had you know with with fuel efficient vehicles and more fuel efficiency demanded by the federal government than the advent and addition of electric vehicles that pay no tax um, and we've not solved that problem yet it's critical that um, this funding be maintained. And so you're going to hear in the presentation today from MJ Maynard uh, some of the nuts and bolts about the taxes, but uh, uh, I just want to let you know that labor is in complete support of this bill. Uh, and um, on behalf of the building trades as well, Southern Nevada building trades are in support of the bill as well. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Commissioner Justin Jones, who is, is here via WebEx today, if I may. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Backus, Vice Chair Considine, and members of the committee. For the record, I am Justin Jones, Vice Chair of the Clark County Commission and Chair of the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. Uh, Assembly Bill 359 would enable the Clark County Board of County Commissioners to extend fuel revenue indexing if we pass an ordinance on or before December 31st, 2026, to authorize the continuation of the program. While serving in the legislature in 2013, I had the opportunity to support FRI with the promise of creating a sustainable funding source for roadway improvements. Since the inception of FRI in 2014, it has generated nearly $2 billion and funded more than 400 critical infrastructure projects. The continuation of this program is critical to building and maintaining roadway infrastructure throughout Southern Nevada. It will also support local women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses and create hundreds of good-paying jobs in the construction industry. Investments in transportation infrastructure through programs such as FRI are critical to accommodate sustainable growth, 
reduce congestion, and ensure that we're able to continue to compete globally in attracting visitors and businesses to Southern Nevada. This funding is needed to sustain jobs and build roadway projects that improve safety, manage congestion, enhance multimodal connectivity, maintain the current infrastructure, and promote economic development. The passage of AB 359 is vital for improving the quality of life of our residents and continuing to strengthen our economy. On behalf of the Clark County Commission and RTC Board, I ask for your support for AB 359. And now I'll hand it over to RTC CEO, MJ Maynard, to provide an overview of the RTC's roadway funding efforts and a summary of what FRI has accomplished for Southern Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Jones, uh, Chair Box, and Vice Chair Constantine, and members of the committee. Um, MJ Maynard, for the record, CEO for the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. Uh, Southern Nevada roadway funding is broken down, as you heard from Dan. It's, uh, let me move my next slide here. Uh, motor vehicle fuel tax, uh, sales tax, and fuel revenue indexing. Uh, and it, again, as you've heard, roadway funding makes it possible for the RTC and its member agencies, and that includes Clark County, the cities of Las Vegas, North Las Vegas, cities of Henderson, Mesquite, Boulder City, and unincorporated Clark County, uh, to move forward with the planning, construction, design, of, and maintenance of transportation projects that benefit millions of Southern Nevada, uh, not only the residents, but also our tourists. Uh, these projects, as uh, you know and have heard, they create jobs. Uh, they put small businesses to work and clearly improve the local economy. So as AB 359 is regarding the continuation of FRI, I would like to briefly discuss the origination of the program. In 2013, the Nevada State Legislature, with overwhelming bipartisan support, passed Assembly Bill 413, which enabled the Clark County Board of Commissioners to index the county's motor vehicle fuel tax to inflation for the period of January 1, 2014, through December 31, 2026, excuse me, 2016, if enacted an ordinance to effectuate the provision of AB 413. The bill also authorized the county commission to provide for increases in these taxes subject to a 10-year rolling average producer price index, or PPI, for highway and street construction that could be no more than 7.8% annually. On September 3rd, 2013, the Clark County Board of Commissioners approved ordinance number 4126, which approved FRI in Clark County and included a 10 cent total cap on increases for the first three years. In 2015, the Nevada State Legislature passed Assembly Bill 191, which simplified the ballot initiative language and process under AB 413. The legislation gave authority over the decision to institute fuel revenue indexing, known as FRI, to each county's voters rather than placing it as a statewide question on the ballot. In November 2016, Clark County question number five was approved by a vote of the people, which extended FRI through December 31st, 2026. At the time, FRI was rejected in all other counties except Washoe County, which already had the program in place. On March 21, 2017, the County Commission amended the 2013 ordinance to cap any increase to the FRI to four cents per gallon annually as part of the ballot question. Let's see. So the historical background uh, brings us to the current Nevada gas tax breakdown. So today, 69.5 cents is collected for every gallon of gas sold in Clark County, 52.2 cents through fuel tax, and 17.3 cents through, through the FRI program. Of that 69.5 cents, as you can see on the slide, 27% goes to the federal government, 30% to the state, 12% to the county, and 31% to the RTC. So uh, just to highlight the success of the program, since 2014, the 405 FRI projects have been awarded. Of those 405 projects awarded, 201 are completed projects. We have 87 active construction and 117 active design FRI projects. Nearly 100 local small businesses have benefited from this program. And we have contracted, as you heard, uh, Chairman Jones say 1.95 billion in FRI through the local jurisdictions. And finally, as noted on the slide, the projects funded and developed in partnership with the local jurisdictions have created more than 10,000 new jobs. So this is a, a, just a visual of the projects that have been funded through FRI, the, the 201 completed projects. 
And this is a visual of the, of the 87 active construction projects and 107 active design FRI projects currently underway in Clark County. So let me explain this, this slide. So um, as you know, the cost of building and maintaining projects has increased due to inflation. So for example, you, you will need $1,350,000 in 2024 to build the same project you constructed in 2014 for $1 million. So inflation uh, has certainly been very impactful. And if you look at the blue line here on this slide, that is, uh, the, the, it represents the annual PPI, and it's uh, been very, very, very volatile, as, as you can see. The green line represents the 10-year rolling average PPI. This average is the percentage used to calculate the annual indexing revenue increases. And so it's really had sort of a smoothing effect in terms of what the annual rate of indexed increase is every single year. The challenge is that the FRI program is only in place until 2026. Passage of Assembly Bill 359 could help continue fuel revenue indexing and generate nearly $1.2 billion over 10 years. The nearly $1.2 billion uh, from the FRI projections doesn't go just to the RTC. It also goes to the state and Clark County for Southern Nevada projects. Uh, the FRI program will help address inflation, sustain jobs, and allow us to maintain and build transportation projects that will benefit Southern Nevada. And I'm certainly open for any questions you may have. have so. Thank you. That concludes our presentation. We're glad to answer any questions that members of the committee may have. Thank you so much for your presentation. Committee members, do we have any questions? We'll start with Assemblyman Nguyen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I am actually uh, also a member of the uh, RTC Transportation Resource Advisory Committee. So this is something that is uh, uh, did not know uh, when I serve on that role that I'd be able to ask this here. Um, in terms of this uh, funding projects that we talked about, of course, there's a lot of things that are going to help um, with the economy and jobs and projects and making sure that our roads away are doing well. Um, I remember we talked about the critical need for funding in terms of transit services. Um, so maybe um, if, if uh, maybe Madam uh, CEO can help us kind of figure this out in terms of this bill, does it help in funding of those additional transit dollars that we need? <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, through you Chair to Assemblyman Wynn. Uh, you are correct, we have a significant uh, transit funding challenge. I, th I think we've been up here speaking with many of you about that challenge. Um, although um, the FRI is, c is constitutionally prohibited from being used for anything other than roadway projects, uh, if AB 359, uh, if this bill is passed and it becomes an ordinance through Clark County Commission, uh, we would have the ability, if you go, if I noted in one of the first slides, um, sales tax collected in Clark County is also used to fund roadway projects. Uh, we would have the ability to, to, to uh, reallocate some of that uh, to, f to fund uh, and maintain our current level of transit service. And uh, Howard Watts, for the record, just to put a finer point on it, we're, we're facing some significant challenges structurally with funding for both transit and our, our transportation infrastructure. Um, so this, this will help mostly by, again, preventing things from getting any worse. If we do not, if for any reason we do not extend fuel revenue indexing, we are going to face uh, some significant problems in both our keep, uh, upkeep of our roadways, maintenance and, and development to meet our community's needs. And, and then there's also gonna be those stresses on the transit system and they're, they're going to multiply because there is absolutely no release valve. Yeah, I thank you, Assemblyman Watts, for, for that comment. I think the transit gap uh, in services is affecting underserved community like the district that I represent. So it's good to hear from uh, CEO uh, Maynard and also Assemblyman Watts on how this could be helpful to that. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Next, we will move to Vice Chair Constein. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for bringing this. I have received numerous emails uh, on this bill from all over the state, so I just want to clarify that this bill only affects Clark County. Is that correct? Howard's wa Howard Watts, for the record, that's correct. We'll go to Minority Leader O'Neill. I was hoping for more time to stall so I could phrase this. <laughs> I think I got a statement, and I promise you there's a question at the end of the statement. And Assemblyman Watts, and particularly you, Mr. Thompson, you may be able to help me with this. If I understand the bill correctly, the voters initially voted 58% to allow for indexing in Clark County for the fuel tax. In the bill, it required that they have to return back to a vote of the people in 2026, you're now suggesting for Clark County alone that we take that away, that vote away from the people, give it to the county commissioners who are elected, and there will be an election for some of them between now and 2026 is part of the question. Um, how do you justify taking away the vote of the people? Uh, and here in Carson City, we just had a similar vote and we voted this down. And I know our roads in Carson City are extremely challenged. The, the mayor continually asked me to go to the state PK and get us some more money for it. And um, that's a separate issue. But that's what I'm dealing with. Help me work through that challenge. Here's the question. Help me work through that issue of removing a vote, another vote that was passed other people and giving it to the county commissioners who some, I don't know how many will be up for election, and this may be an election point, to deal with your issues from, from the perspective of Carson City. So, Madam Chair, for the record, Danny Thompson. Uh, to Assemblyman O'Neill, this was already passed by a vote of the people, overwhelmingly. And I think back to the campaign. I worked on that campaign. My company worked on that campaign. Uh, I, I, those of you who lived there during that time knew the uh, Orange Cone Brigade that we had and all the problems that associated with that. This is critical. And so giving it, given that it's already had a vote of the people and, so, and passed overwhelmingly, uh, giving that decision to Clark County commissioners uh, you elected as legislators are 500 miles away from your constituents. Uh, if you're a Clark County commissioner, they walk in your office and talk to you every day. And so I, I, think, it's, I think it's prudent to do that. And on the other side of the coin, without this, without this funding, you are going to have problems. Not, and uh, Simon Wynn mentioned transit is already a disaster in Clark County. Um, for the people who have to try to get to work on the transit system, but the road systems in Clark County, are, it's critical to have th this funding. The other thing I want you to think about for a minute is that the Las Vegas Strip and Las Vegas is the major part of the state's budget. 40-something percent back in the day, I don't know what it is today, but I imagine it's probably pretty close to the same, is generated on that seven miles of road. And so keeping that in good working order and safe for not just for our constituents, but for our tourists that come here and pay the bills is critical. And so, you know, the fact that the county commission is the closest government to the people, I don't think it's a problem. Thank you. Howard Watts, for the record, I'd just like to add on to a little bit of that. First of all, just to give um, some precise clarity on the question you asked about uh, the county commissioners up for election. Between now and 2026, every single county commissioner will be on the ballot um, and and they will continue to be on the ballot afterwards and so there's there is continued accountability to the people um, again this was passed um, by a vote of the people uh, initially and when a lot of this was being discussed and debated and I know I, I was not uh, in the body at that time but you know it, it was discussed about there should be a vote of the people to, to indicate the willingness to move forward uh, with this. And, and again, Clark County had that. To the, to the point that you brought up though about Carson City, um, 
you know, I, I just like to also note we heard uh, in in uh, Ways and Means Committee about uh, issues related to uh, funding for uh, capital costs for schools, particularly in Elko County, which have been um, restricted or rejected by the voters. And uh, there are some extremely um, difficult decisions and, and crumbling facilities um, that, that that county is having to deal with. So uh, I understand where, where some of those constituents are coming from. I think that we are attempting to uh, do something that respects the framework that was discussed when this moved forward in the past, which was put it up to a vote of the people where it did, where it did pass. Um, but also to, to your point about the state, we have a responsibility to everybody in this state to try and make sure that we are uh, providing the, the critical infrastructure and services that folks need. Um, and, and this is making sure that, that we're gonna be able to continue to do that. May I follow up, Chair, please? Something wants, yeah. I appreciate that, and I, I've said that several times in statements that when I have to vote on an issue that deals solely with Clark County, that I ask for the same respect in return when we have an issue, like you say, in Elko, the rurals, because I do think that at times respectfully said to you and your Clark County fellow assembly people that you forget that there are other parts of the state. Um, so I, I truly appreciate that. And Mr. Thompson, I appreciate your conversation and your comments. I'd like to discuss it in more in depth offline if you'd stop by sometime. But if I understood correctly, how, question, how many county commissioners are there? Not coming from Clark, I don't know. So uh, you got to educate me a little bit. And you specified all of them are up for re-election between now and 26 or their election would be on 26, which clarify that for me, please. Thank you for that question. Howard Watts, for the record, we have seven county commissioners in Clark County, uh, and they serve four-year terms. So uh, roughly half will be up in 2024, and the other half will be up in 2026 uh, when, when uh, they would need to take action on FRI by. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the time. I appreciate it greatly from all of you. Thank you so much. We'll go to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, so I believe Assemblymember Watts said that the existing rates continue as long as the bonds are outstanding if FRI isn't improved. Um, so let's say this doesn't pass or the county commission, we do pass it and the county commission doesn't pass it. Is there a plan about what happens next? Is there a guidance that you've already kind of worked out? Like, well, you know, RTC is gonna take the first hit, so we know that our, our people who use RTC are gonna have the first issues, or do we know it's gonna be roads, or it's gonna be to our new developments that where we're developing new neighborhoods in the outskirts, that's where we're gonna see the biggest hits or where we're first going to see those hits? Thank you for that question, Howard Watts, for the record, and I'll turn it over to the RTC to maybe talk in a little bit of additional detail, uh, but I'll speak bluntly. If, uh, no matter what happens, if under any circumstances, uh, fuel revenue indexing is not extended, it's going to have um, some significant negative consequences. To your point, uh, so the, the way the current framework is, is that the indexing that has gone into place those rates would be there and would support bonds that have been issued to support projects. So we wouldn't see cataclysmic <laughs> level impacts right away. But again, if, for every year that we are no longer conducting any type of indexing, we are watching um, our revenues to support critical infrastructure projects uh, erode at an accelerated rate compared to the need due to the impacts of, of inflation. And so those are going to continue to compound. We won't be able to do additional bonding based on uh, future uh, fuel indexing revenues. And that is going to impact both um, uh, rehabilitation projects and existing roadways that need um, maintenance and repair, as well as the construction or expansion of 
uh, roadway infrastructure in in growing developing communities. <clears throat> Excuse me, through chair to a slimy woman, uh, Council Nine. Uh, and you are exactly right. What we're seeing today, even with the program in place, because of inflation, uh, many of the projects that are coming in, uh, compare it, coming in now sort of repriced, if you will, compared to original estimates, we're seeing some uh, projects, many projects are increasing costs 50 to sometimes 100%. So today, uh, the local jurisdictions are able to do less projects because of inflation, just based on, on the, the cost of doing business. And so we're already seeing a, a, sort of a, 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 an impact to what's happening with the, with, the, with the program that's created in place. If indexing discontinues, um, uh, Chairman Watts is exactly right, or it, it will uh, significantly impact uh, what we'll be able to do, we meaning the jurisdictions, we'll be able to do in the future. Uh, as an example, uh, we may see Fuel revenue indexing may may stop because it's it's not indexed anymore at a, at a, at a static rate of eighty five million dollars a year. Uh, that doesn't do a lot, and so uh, it it will have a significant and long term uh, impact to uh, to Clark County. If if I may, Danny Thompson, for the record, you know one of the other problems is the transit system in Clark County has been negatively impacted. Uh, when, when we passed the transportation network companies, we had one bus route that made money. The only route in Clark County made money uh, was a strip route. Once the transportation companies came in, that went to an, had to be subsidized. And so if you think about having to maintain a system that allows the number of employees that work in the seven miles of the Las Vegas Strip 24 hours a day is a huge undertaking. And the transit system is woefully lacking and I know the committee the track committee is we're trying to find solutions and money solutions if this doesn't pass I mean the problems are going to be just compounded like I, 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 I shudder to think what it would look like because then if if this doesn't then you all are going to have to come up with something some new tax uh, or something uh, to make up the difference because at the end of the day we have to provide a safe and reliable roadway. Thank you so much for that. Um, our last question is gonna come from Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this. Um, you mentioned it uh, briefly, but just for the record, can you talk about the caps that do exist? Um, thank you. Uh, MJ made it for record through you, Chair, uh, to Assemblywoman uh, Mosca. Uh, so the Clark County Commission, well, first of all, I believe in the, the, the statute itself, there was a, a cap in, in terms of ensuring that the fuel revenue indexing program uh, would be, it was either the the average, of the 10-year rolling average PPI or, if it, or which was, or the lesser of 7.8% uh, when it, it was uh, brought back to the Clark County Commission in, in an ordinance. Uh, uh, it, the Clark County Commission at that time put an additional constraint on that and added an, another four cent cap, an annual four cent cap per year. So it, it, it truly has uh, constraints in place, uh, not only that happened here at the state level, but also by way of the Clark County, uh, Clark County Commission. Thank you so much, and um, for the presenters, thank you. And we will go ahead and move um, to testimony in support of Assembly Bill 359. Um, I don't want to rush you guys. I have a feeling we have a lot of people here in support of it tonight. So um, we're going to permit like 25 minutes um, support and 25 minutes in opposition. So go ahead and start when you're ready. I will. Uh, Madam Chair, um, committee members, Bill Wellman, representing Las Vegas Paving here today. Um, <clears throat> Uh, briefly, um, based on the testimony of the presenters, um, this has always been enabling to the county commissioners. It was enabling in AB 413 back in 2013. It was enabling again in 2015. It was enabling with the passage or uh, the ballot measure passes, passing in 2016. <clears throat> the county commissioners rec recognized that in the, in the last question. Uh, of, of uh, Assemblyman Mosca, um, it had the fail-safe mechanisms in it at 7.8%, um, 
and the county commission took action to ensure that it was not a complete runaway and a burden on the community uh, by adding another four cents, whichever is less uh, moving forward. Now, with that said, um, fuel revenue indexing has been instrumental uh, in allowing infrastructure improvements uh, to keep in sync with inflation, unquestionably, and creating jobs. Um, in 2012, Las Vegas Paving had 1,400 employees, were the largest contractor in the state. In 2000, excuse me, in 2009, we had 1,400 employees. In 2012, we were down to 550 because of the lack of jobs. Um, today, we are back at 1,400 on our payroll because of fuel revenue indexing directly. However, today and now, and part of this legislation modification is we must, must ensure that we've created all these jobs. We gotta ensure we, we sustain those jobs. And that won't happen if FRI doesn't continue as Assemblyman Watts, I think, and Danny Thompson alluded to. Um, FRI has successfully dem demonstrated uh, 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 what it does by still producing and currently maintaining those good high paying jobs um, over the last nine years. Enhancing and maintaining our local infrastructure, which is clearly important. Um, and it's passive in conservatively adjusting to the, to the rate of inflation um, with the caps that we have on it over a 10 year rolling average. It's user based. If you're not driving a vehicle, you're not paying the tax. And most importantly, it creates an infrastructure improvements that are tangible. Uh, those that you can see, touch, and most importantly, use, and which we are all the benefactors of, and regardless of the mode of transportation we have. Um, in this building, over the last several weeks, we've talked a lot about apprentices, and many of you have been a part of those. Those apprentice opportunities go away when jobs go away. This is very important. Uh, your support of AB 359 can help ensure um, that we continue to have this job creation and ensure the sustaining of the jobs with, that we all have created. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, guys. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Assemblyman. My name is Stacy Lindbergh. I'm the owner of CNS Company. You heard him say that it affected 100 small businesses when they put the indexing in. I am, I don't know about the other 99, but I am one of them that was greatly affected by the indexing. I'm a survivor of 2008. I was in Las Vegas and in Clark County as a contractor for a public works when they turned out the lights, basically. Indexing 100% saved the small business in Clark County. Not only are, have, we work for every entity, not just one. It's helped us with our work with the state, the city, city of Henderson, RTC, and the county. I had, in 2008, I had 10 employee, 10 employees. I now have 67 that are full-time employees. So it did create the job work. They're union, union employees. They all have medical. They all have health. And they all have benefits, and they also pipe support families in, my, in our area. So this is a critical path to us. This isn't something that isn't passionate. This is what funds my lifestyle, not only because of what I spend and what they spend, what I get from the county, but I also spend that. That's how I buy tractors. That's how I stay sustainable in my market. Thank you guys so much. I can't imagine when we talk about the first person to go out if it doesn't pass, you're looking at it. It's a small business. It's me. It's your DBE contractor. I'm the first one to go. So the work that has been put on my plate is a large. It's largely due to the public work projects that you've put out in this market. So thank you again for the first time, and I hope for your support on the second AB 357 or 359. Good evening, everyone. For the record, Tom Morley representing Laborers Local 872 and Laborers Local 169 here in Reno. I'd like to thank Assemblyman O'Neill for meeting with me this afternoon before the hearing and allowing us to explain some of the issues we have done in Clark County, and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Warren Hardy today representing Warren Hardy. 
When I was asked to, uh, when I was asked to chair the track committee, uh, I said I'll do it under one condition, and that is that Danny Thompson is the vice chair. I didn't know at that time there was going to be a coup. However, I'm teasing my friend Danny. Danny's my friend. Danny's my mentor, uh, and I trust nobody more to bring this bill forward with the RTC than my friend Danny. You know, Madam Chair, when I started chairing the committee, and I'd been on track for some time like Danny and was asked to chair it last year, and I, I went in with some grand ideas about aspirational things we could do in transportation in Nevada, in Southern Nevada, to make Southern Nevada a leader. Like, we go to other states and we see some of the fantastic transportation opportunities that they have in other states, and those things ought to belong in Nevada, in Southern Nevada, in Las Vegas. And that was the aspirational goal I went into this last year of track with. I very quickly realized that that's not a place we're in right now. Uh, we're in a place where public transportation in Southern Nevada is an, an existential threat. That the dollars that are needed are necessary because of the, some of the things Mr. Thompson t talked about with in, in terms of eroding our tax base are not there and are not available. And I'll, I'll tell you one compelling moment during the committee hearing, I said to the committee, and I, and I, and I will say this to, to Assemblyman O'Neill's question, Madam Chair, the, the track committee is probably the most diverse and well-represented committee I've ever served on, and I serve on a lot of these. Um, but I asked the committee in a very compelling moment, I said, is there, we talked about this existential threat, and I said, is there anybody on this committee who does not believe that the RTC has an obligation to provide transportation of last resort to individuals who cannot get to work any other way. Is there anybody that does not believe that's our most compelling and important mission and not a single hand went up? And that's the kind of existential threat we're, 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 we're facing here. That's what the extension of the fry will allow us to address. I do, and, and I, I don't remember who asked the question. It was a very good question about contingency plans and how we're going to fund this if this doesn't get advanced. The answer to that as chairman of tra the track committee is I don't know. I don't know where to start on that conversation. This is an existential issue for Southern Nevada and our transportation needs of those who are dependent on these systems to get to and from work. This is not about getting to a concert on the strip. This is not about going down and gambling. This is an existential issue for those who need transportation in Southern Nevada. I thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon, Chair Backus and members of the committee. My name is Candace Townsend, and I represent the city of North Las Vegas, and I'm here to testify in support of AB 359. The continuation of the fuel revenue indexing funding will allow us to continue to address the city's infrastructure, improve congestion, and improve safety for all modes of traffic. We have used the funds to perform various safety improvements near school sites as part of the school safety program, ADA upgrades to improve ADA accessibility citywide, and major roadway construction and reconstruction, such as improving Las Vegas Boulevard, Lamb Boulevard, and Simmons Street. I want to thank Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno, Assemblyman Watts, and the RTC for bringing this forward. We support AB 359, and we urge you to do the same. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I am Paul Enos. I'm the CEO of the Nevada Trucking Association, and we're here today to support Assembly Bill 359. I served on the Alternative Funding Working Group, and there were a lot of different things we talked about, and a lot of things I voted no on. This wasn't one of them. You know, I'm blessed to represent an industry that moves 95.3% of freight in the Silver State. We pay about 40% of all the taxes, state, federal, local taxes for our roads, responsible for about 9% of all miles traveled. So we do pay our way, and we prefer paying our way in fuel tax. Why do we like fuel tax? Well, we like fuel tax because it is the most efficient mechanism that is out there to pay for our roads. For every dollar that's collected, it costs the state about three cents. You don't get a better bang for your buck than that. Um, in 2013, we worked um, with the RTC, 
me and Mr. Wellman had a lot of conversations back when we used to have a deli, a long negotiation on how this uh, bill was going to work. And um, I will say, I think the Clark County Index is better than the Washoe County Index. It's better because it does have that 7.8% cap. It's better because my sticking point was it doesn't penalize our interstate trucking companies that are purchasing fuel in Clark County and using it out of state. We got that fix. We are very happy with the fuel tax mechanism. Um, just for some understanding, the base level of our federal fuel taxes have not been raised since 1992. In the state of Nevada, 1993, yeah, maybe it's 91 and 92 in Nevada. So we have not raised the base rate of our fuel tax in a long time. The fuel tax index works. It's something that's efficient. And we support this and would appreciate you moving this forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Ron Young. I represent the IBW Local 357. Um, to try to keep my comments brief, I'd like to raise up and echo a lot of the comments that have already been made. I think everyone understands the importance of this bill, and I want to thank the sponsors and the RTC for bringing this forward, and I urge that this committee stands in support of AB 359. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Russell Rowe here on behalf of the Nevada Council, or excuse me, Nevada Chapter of the American Council of Engineering Companies, so your engineering uh, industry in Nevada. We were um, founding members of of the group Moving FRI back in 2013. Um, we have a letter um, that we submitted for the record for um, details for your reference, but um, we stand in strong support of this legislation. It is the top priority for the engineers this session. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Michael Hillerby on behalf of RTC Washoe. Very pleased to be here today in support of our colleagues at RTC Southern Nevada. We've enjoyed the benefits of fuel tax indexing in Washoe County for several years. That uh, additional revenue has allowed us to keep pace with the rising cost of labor and materials. This revenue doesn't just help us build roads. Uh, we use approximately one third of it for our pavement preservation program to, use, to keep those new roads uh, working well and serving our, our constituents. Um, we also use it to support a larger transportation system. It helps uh, make our community safer for pedestrians and cyclists. We've put, used it for new sidewalks, bike lanes, cycle tracks, multi-use paths. It allows for better public transportation because we're enable, able to build lanes uh, and facilities for buses as a part of that. It makes, uh, again, roadway improvements that make it safer for everyone. It's been a real bonus uh, for our community and a real benefit, and we're happy to support the efforts of our colleagues. Thank you. Thanks. Andy Donahue, Labor Employers Cooperation and Education Trust. Glad to support this legislation and investment. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Backus and members of the committee. For the record, Dylan Keith with the Vegas Chamber. As the largest and broadest business-based organization in the state of Nevada, we were in support of this legislation in 2013, and we are in support of this continuing legislation. Not only is an efficient and um, modernized transportation system efficient, or especially necessary for a thriving business economy. We are also in support of this because it is essential for a, our smallest, most underserved communities, as well as our veteran minority owned and women owned businesses. For those reasons, we ask for your support and thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair Backus. Members of the committee, Nicole Rourke, representing the city of Henderson. Um, we're here to support AB 359. Um, we are projecting over $600 million in um, projects over the next 10 years. And certainly, this is a very important revenue stream um, to provide uh, stable revenue for the next 10 years. So we thank you, and we're here to support. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Alexis Motorex with the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors representing the commercial construction industry in Northern Nevada. We're in strong support of AB 359. Washoe County, as you know, has a similar mechanism in place to index our fuel tax to keep pace with inflation, the increasing cost of construction, and the growing needs of our community. Without this ability to index, there would be no way that Washoe RTC could have kept pace with the exponential growth we have seen in the last decade. County commissioners are elected to represent their constituents. It makes sense that they should be entrusted with the ability to determine if continuing to index a fuel tax is in the best interest of their constituents and the infrastructure needs of the county. 
Another ballot question to allow voters to decide is a costly endeavor for everyone. Commissioners are in the best position to assess need and hear the concerns on both sides of the issue before making a final determination. We urge your support. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you. My name is Chris Burke. I'm with Granite Construction Regional Vice President for our Nevada operations. So I oversee our operations in northern Nevada and southern Nevada. So I'm well, well versed on these, uh, these revenue indexing items uh, that support our communities. So we're here to say that we're in strong support of it. Uh, fuel revenue indexing is crucial to sustainability of our critical infrastructure projects. And, you know, that just goes beyond just the roadways. It's, it's all about safety, as you've heard. I'm kind of repeating or reiterating other people, but inflation and uh, eroding revenue because of EVs and, and more fuel efficient vehicles is a real problem. So that's why we're in strong support. Obviously the county commissioners have been elected by their constituents and therefore they're the best uh, to represent those constituents um, on, on these types of matters. The bill is extremely important for our employees and the communities that we work and live and play in. So uh, thank you for your time and urge your strong support. Good evening, Ch Chair Backus, members of the committee. My name is Glenn Levitt, Director of Government Affairs for the Nevada Contractors Association, representing over 450 contractors, subcontractors, and affiliated industry professionals, primarily in Southern Nevada. The Nevada Contractors Association is in support of SB 359 and its ability to create jobs and continue to prove our transit and roadway projects in Southern Nevada. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Bacchus and uh, Vice Chair Constantine. Peter Kruger with I3 Public Affairs, representing uh, today Nevada's fuel jobbers, the men, the men and women who collect these taxes that we're, we're talking about every day. So to be brief, to quote Thomas Jefferson, the uh, government closest to the people serves the people best. We urge your support. Good evening, Madam Chair, committee, staff. My name is Zach Bucher with the City of Las Vegas. Here in support of this bill, the exponential growth in Southern Nevada necessitates this, uh, this bill, this action. This is good for infrastructure, good for transportation, and it is good for jobs. So the city of Las Vegas is here in support. Thank you. Good Thank evening. you so much. Next, we'll go to um, the phone lines. BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines wishing to give testimony in support of Assembly Bill 359? Callers, if you'd like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 359, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Bacchus and committee members. For the record, my name is Peter Guzman, president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce. I am also a member of the RTC Transportation Resource Advisory Committee and a member of the Nevada Department of Transportation Advisory Working Group. Over the last several years, the Latin Chamber and our members have been keenly aware of the need to continue investing in transportation for all users and communities throughout Southern Nevada. I am testifying today in support of Assembly Bill 359, which would extend the fuel revenue indexing program that we supported in the past in order to sustain good paying jobs and create opportunities to continue maintaining and enhancing mobility throughout our region. On a personal level, this bill is now a matter of survival for my community that has sometimes no cars or maybe one. Transportation is key for my community to get to jobs, to their doctors. And so, yeah, for us, it's a matter of survival at this point. So I urge you to support Assembly Bill 359. Thank you so much. Next caller, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Down Newsom, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, the chair of the Nevada NCA, uh, Nevada Contractors Association Diverse Contractors Council. Small and diverse contractors of the council support the annual increases or indexing of the fuel tax for the purposes of continuing infrastructure enhancements throughout Southern Nevada. The investment in FRI has not only created new roadway projects throughout the valley, 
but has diversified the opportunities for small and diverse companies to expand their capabilities in the roadway construction arena. Today, projects like the revitalization of Jack Street in the historic West Side and Las Vegas neighborhood uh, are funded through FRI, which activates one of the big moves of the 100 plan to improve the historic community. The indexing of fuel tax has in, enhanced the roads, enhanced small and diverse contractors' capabilities, and enhanced the historic and newly developed communities in Southern Nevada. Thank you to the bill sponsors and RTC Southern Nevada for bringing the solution forward for roadway improvement and the enhancement of the lives of Southern Nevada. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you so much. And I believe BPS, there's no one else on the line wishing to give testimony in support of AB 359. Chair, there are no more callers at this time. Perfect. Next, we will go ahead and move into testimony in the opposition to Assembly Bill 359. Those wishing to give testimony in the opposition, please make your way to the front here in Carson City and begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Janine Hansen. I'm the state president of Nevada Families for Freedom. I wasn't planning to testify on this bill, but because there aren't any um, teleconferencing to Vegas, I felt that I would go ahead and speak for those of the people in Clark County that I represent. <clears throat> Many things have changed since the original vote of the people on fuel indexing. The price of gas has significantly increased. Inflation is now a significant factor. It appears that the reason for this bill is that they are afraid of a vote of the people. There was a good case made today, a compelling case for fuel indexing in Clark County. Sell that to the people and have an election. Do we believe in democracy or not? I wonder if the vote would have been as uh, significant had people realized that their vote later on would be taken away from them to vote on this important issue. Many things have changed. Thank you. Casey Rogers, for the record, um, I would just echo exactly what she just said. And taking the vote away from the people, I'm opposed to. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and we obviously made the phone lines available, so anybody throughout our state can also call in this evening due to limited space at the Grant Sawyer building. So with that, BPS, are, is there anyone on the phone lines wishing to give testimony in opposition to Assembly Bill 359? Callers, if you'd like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 359, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of this committee. My name is Alita Benson, Executive Director of the Nevada Republican Party, testifying in opposition to Assembly Bill 359 on behalf of the Nevada Republican Party. It has recently come to light that a dubiously legal practice of funding, funding luxury cars for state and county government officials is happening on the taxpayer dime. Not many Nevadans get the perks of receiving an annual car allowance for their 2022 Audi A4, like officials in Clark County do. They may not have to worry about an increase in the gas tax, but regular Nevadans do. Clark County pays out about 100000 in mileage reimbursements to employees each year to complement their fleet of luxury Teslas for county employees. Teslas who do not pay a gas tax to support the roads that they use. They have a spending problem, not a revenue problem. The county commissioners have an important cap on their taxation powers for gas taxes. These proposed tax increases have to be noticed to the public and voted on. Many of those who testified in support said that the county governments exist to represent their constituents. It doesn't seem that their constituents are being represented very well if their constituents voted against this, and yet this would override the will of the voters. All of these people who listed the benefits to their bottom line should have no issue convincing voters of these same merits. This bill would provide yet another backdoor tax targeting our most vulnerable fixed income seniors and minimum wage earners. This would remove the authority of voters to consent to taxes and replace it with fiat rule by the county commissioners who need merely authorized annual increases. This bill is entirely Democrat sponsored. 
Why then are the sponsors seeking to subvert, subvert democracy and remove the consent of the governed for this tax increase? For these reasons, the Nevada Republican Party strongly opposes AB 359. Thank you. T-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. We've raised taxes many times for the roads. Where have they really gone? The 215 and 95 interchange in Centennial is still under construction, and it seems like it's been like a decade. Clark County already pays about 20, 30 cents more in taxes than nearby Nye County. I want the people to have more power, and I want a larger audit of where these tax funds are going. The state of Nevada right now is paying the second highest gas taxes, or gas prices, excuse me, in the country. We do not have the second highest gas taxes. Pennsylvania has the second highest gas taxes, yet they pay 50 cents less for gasoline than we do here in Nevada. Why? Because our main source of gasoline comes from California. So if we want to address gas taxes, we have to address why we pay the second highest gasoline prices in the country. In fact, during March of 2022, when Ukraine was being invaded, most of the country went up 70 cents. Nevada and California went up a dollar fifty. There's some rigging going on. Address this issue first. Furthermore, gas taxes are becoming more outdated. We're seeing the rise of electric cars, so therefore we should focus more on mileage and registration, just like they are doing in the state of Hawaii except for the tourist areas. Not to mention, the urban planning system in Las Vegas is among the worst in the world, with much of the traffic going to four- to six-lane roads, collector roads, arterials. These are the ones that are in between freeways and calm streets. We need to grow more responsibly and avoid building these types of developments because the revenue per capita is very, very low. Not to mention, I haven't heard from the legislature what caused the mass inflation in the last two years. And speaking of transit, bus systems are increasingly outdated. We need to move towards greater technologies. I spoke to the Clark County Sustainability Plan and moved to something that is more about personal or group rapid transit, which is one of the latest technologies and gets far more bang for your buck. But other than that, please do not support this. Yield my time. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you so much. Now we will move to testimony in the neutral. Is there anyone here in Carson City wishing to give neutral testimony to Assembly Bill 359? Okay. BPS, is there anyone on the phone line wishing to give testimony in the neutral to Assembly Bill 359? If you'd like to testify in neutral for Assembly Bill 359, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, we'd be happy to have the bill. I know the bill sponsor, one of them had to take off because of a conf con conflict this evening. So, Mr. Thompson, if you wish to give closing remarks, that'd be appreciated. For the record, Danny Thompson, I uh, just want to thank the committee um, for your consideration and, and really thoughtful questions. I think you can see from the groups that got up here and testified in favor of this how critical this need is and how much this is needed. And, you know, further, you know, right now, electric vehicles don't pay anything. And they are just expanding in, in use in the roads. They're driving on the roads and tearing the roads up, and that's one of the problems with the gas tax. That we, that's one of the things that we have to fix. And so just want to thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much. With that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 359. And um, as I indicated, we are going to take some stuff out of order this evening. So we will be opening the hearing on ACR 7. And um, BPS, I know we probably have someone who's going to be co-presenting on this resolution um, who will be appearing remotely. So with that, um, when the presenter is ready to get started, feel free to start. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Anderson and, oh, 
Are we Actually, ready? Actually, we're not quite ready yet, Mr. Guzman. It'll be just a moment. Okay. Sounds good. Sorry about that, Chair. I'm ready whenever you are. Good afternoon, good morning, or good afternoon, Chair Bacchus, Vice Chair Constantine, and members of the Revenue Committee. Thank you for allowing me to present ACR 7. My name is Assemblywoman Natha Anderson. It is my honor to represent Assembly District 30, the heart of Sparks. As we all know, our investment in this in our neighbors and cons and what's wrong? Sorry, there are distractions, so it'll be just a moment. Okay, as we all know, our investment in our neighbors, our friends, and our constituents are essential for the strength of our state. In other words, our tax dollars are essential. We just heard a presentation about that whether or not we are in fact investing in each other and ways to help each other. They fund things we love and we rely upon, from public schools, including our universities, to roads, to state parks, to firefighters, to hospitals, to essential services that make us, our state wonderful. But the way we raise these funds matters, and unfortunately, Nevada does not tax, collect taxes equally. As a result of this broken system, our state can't adequately fund, cannot adequately fund the supports and services our communities, our neighbors, and our children need to thrive and prepare for the future in an ever-changing world. With the chair's permission, may Marco Guzman of the Institution, Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy explain a bit more about the Nevada's regressive tax structure with the PowerPoint that can be found on Nellis and that also I will be going through. Is that all right, Chair Bacchus? Mr. Guzman, would you like to take over? Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Anderson, and thank you, Chairman and uh, members of the Assembly for the opportunity to speak on the topic of Nevada's state tax system. My name is Marco Guzman and I'm a senior policy analyst with the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. We are a nonprofit nonpartisan tax policy organization and we conduct analyses and provide data-driven recommendations on how to shape equitable and sustainable tax systems. And you can go to slide two, please. Great. I'm on slide two at this time. Thank you. In this presentation, uh, I will give an overview of Nevada's tax system, what it looks like, and its impact on residents and how wealth taxes can help add much needed progressivity and equity to the tax code. As you can see here, most state taxes, tax systems are upside down, meaning that they take a much greater share of income from low and middle income families than from wealthy families. This only worsens income inequality by making incomes more unequal after state and local taxes are collected. And it may surprise some that states that are generally commended as being quote unquote low tax states like Texas, Florida, and Nevada are actually high tax for low and middle income families. Next slide, please. To get a better idea of this, let's take a look at Nevada's tax system. As you can see, this graph shows the impact of Nevada's state and local taxes as a share of family income. You'll notice that the tax structure is regressive, meaning that effective tax rates are higher for low income households, but decrease as income goes up. And we use effective tax rates because they help us measure a household's tax burden 
as they are calculated by taking a household's tax liability and dividing it by their total income. According to our most recent analysis of the tax systems in all 50 states plus Washington, D.C., Nevada ranks as the fifth most unequal and regressive tax structure. Next slide, please. To get a better understanding as to why, it is first worth talking about the taxes that make up state revenue collections. State budgets are primarily supported by three main tax types, income taxes, which include personal and corporate income taxes, sales and excise taxes, and property taxes. The last two are regressive taxes, with the sales tax traditionally being the most regressive tax because individuals are taxed the same dollar amount regardless of their income. An income tax with graduated rates, on the other hand, is based on ability to pay. As tax rates increase, incomes go up. All of the most equitable tax systems in our report and analysis include personal income tax, uh, include personal income taxes, which are progressive, though to varying degrees. So it is no surprise when looking at Nevada's tax structure, <clears throat> why you see uh, it being so regressive. There's a high reliance on sales and consumption taxes and necessities like groceries are included in the sales tax base. There is no income tax and the state lacks refundable tax credits to help offset the other regressive taxes. Next slide, please. Recently, Washington State, which in our analysis and report uh, is the most unequal, has the most unequal tax system, uh, enacted a 7% capital gains excise tax that applies to profits over $250,000 and does not include real estate or retirement accounts. And the tax is expected to raise $500 million annually. Last year in Massachusetts, voters approved the fair share amendment, which creates a 4% surcharge on incomes over $1 million. And the revenue will specifically help fund education and transportation projects. And in Arizona, voters approved the 2020 ballot measure that would have also added a surcharge to the top tax rate and applied to single filers earning over $250,000 and joint filers earning over $500,000 the legal challenges and the previous administration's efforts overturn the measure. Policy reforms that include taxing wealth or high incomes remain as popular options for both lawmakers and voters, and for good reason. They will help introduce more progressivity to the state tax code, lessen extreme levels of economic and racial inequality, and generate new revenue to put toward important public services. It would be wise to, at the very least, explore the impacts of tax policy options that include taxes on wealth, thus ensuring that Nevada takes the first step down a more equitable path toward broadly shared prosperity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Guzman. There's a few more pieces of information that I'd also like to bring forward. And there was a poll that was taken by the tax justice poll conducted in December of 2022 through January of 2023. And of the respondents, 50% were Democrats, 48% were Republicans, 2% did not tell us which way they voted. So they did not specify which party they were a part of. And although there were numerous tax related questions in the interest of time, which I greatly appreciate you giving me this time again, Chair, I'd just like to bring up three. 66% supported increasing taxes on the wealthiest individuals in our state. This support, when actually clarified that it would be billionaires or even above $10 million millionaires, this support went to 70%. 70% believe that the wealthiest individuals in our state need to pay their fair share. In other words, the idea is for the ultra wealthy, not for the working class, not for the middle class. This is for the ultra wealthy to begin to pay their fair share. When asked as to how to use these new funds, Nevada voters specified K through 12 public education with almost 70%, affordable housing with more than 61%, and public health care was at 59%. So the question comes across, why not just bring it forward as a constitutional amendment? 
because that is what would be needed. And why not try to automatically just do that as the question? Why exactly am I trying to make it into a study? Mr. Guzman said the perfect verb, and that was explore. The main issue is time, but more importantly, we need to explore what exactly does that mean. And as a state, we need to take this thoughtfully. We need to have a thoughtful conversation across the aisle. This is not one party or a second or another party. This is not one house versus a, another house. This is about having a thoughtful conversation, not just during a legislative session. We need to consider what it would be to implement this. And as I started to bring this forward, I started going down a rabbit hole, or in the words of our wonderful Mr. Gindin, rabbit colony, of what exactly const constitutes a wealth tax. How much would that be? What would the percentage that we would need to utilize? Is there a difference between an inheritance and an estate tax? Is there, what about a capital or an unrealized gains tax? What exactly does this mean and how exactly would this be defined? Our LCB staff was wonderful with discussions, but every question I asked created three more. And instead of trying to just do one thing really quickly, let's take our time. Let's study this over the interim. And let's bring forward a thoughtful approach. If you look over the bill, you will see that these items are actually mentioned. First, we have the little bit of the preamble. And then on the back side are actually the questions that will actually be included. How many states currently utilize an estate tax or a wealth tax? How much money does a billionaire tax really mean? Is it for the people who earn that money, or is it for the people that inherit it? Do we include those other items? There are so many other questions that we need to have, and we need to ask, and we need to take this thoughtfully. In other words, and for those of you playing legislative lingo bingo, hopefully this will help you out, this is not a one and done answer. And it should instead have a thoughtful, engaging discussion, again, from both sides of the political aisle as well as from both sides of our legislative houses. I'd like to just end with something that's actually stated on the preamble, if you would please look on page one, line 11. Whereas, the state must ensure that its wealthiest residents are sharing equitably in the responsibility of finding governmental services in the state. Equality, responsibility, funding governmental entity services. Are we doing this? Quite frankly, it's time for us as elected officials to take a careful, thoughtful study of our system and address the wealth inequalities created by it. Thank you for your consideration, and I would be more than happy to attempt to answer questions. Thank you so much for your presentation. We'll start with Assemblyman Hafen. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions. Um, I'll, I'll start with the um, easiest question, hopefully. Uh, line one of, uh, and just a clarification, this is a resolution, not a bill. Um, line one refers to studies. Um, however, those studies have not been provided to us today. Um, so I was hoping that possibly uh, those could be provided so we could actually see where those studies are coming from uh, or if there are multiple studies. Um, I would like to uh, actually see those uh, before this came to a vote. Uh, second, I'd like to uh, go to slide three, um, and I want to discuss um, the chart that you have up there. Um, you discuss the total state and local taxes in Nevada, um, and then if you look at the lowest, uh, you're claiming that they're paying 10% or 10.2% of an effective tax rate. And I'm just struggling with that. Um, right now, sales tax is roughly 8%. Um, groceries are not taxed. Rent is not taxed. Um, at that 20,500 income level, people are qualifying for Medicaid, SNAP, um, as well as a number of other uh, benefits through the state. 
Uh, and so I'm just kind of curious how we get to a 10.2% effective tax rate when they are eligible for uh, a number of assistance programs throughout the state and our sales tax is only at 8%. I should say Clark County is slightly over 8%, and the rest of the state is under uh, 8%. So if you could clarify where the 10.2% uh, and how that's calculated, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question, uh, Assembly Member. Uh, Mr. Guzman, would you like to explain that? Yes, um, thank you for your question. Uh, the effective tax rate, as I mentioned, uh, is calculated by um, calculating a, an individual's um, total tax liability and then dividing that by their total income. Um, I think the issue is is um, the, mainly is the the sales tax and how the state uh, depends primarily on the sales tax for revenue um, and its impact on low income families. Um, if you have, uh, say, you know, an eight thousand dollar income, and this is just an example, but um, you pay two thousand dollars on uh, of taxes, you know, that's twenty five percent of of your uh, total income. So. Um, uh, I think that's something that is just really striking and, and um, uh, not, not a lot of people quite understand um, is that that effect on that uh, effect on uh, people's income, that, that effect that taxes on people's income. Um, also, low income families, you know, they spend a lot of their um, income, primarily almost all of it, on items that are sales taxable. Um, and so that's why you see uh, the the regressive nature of of uh, this state tax system, and especially the sales tax. And then your the first portion of your question as well, we will provide you with that with the studies that have been done. Well, uh, thank you. That the actual no question wasn't answered. Um, I would like an answer to the question, if possible. It makes absolutely no sense to me that we're showing an effective tax rate of ten point two percent when you're claiming that sales tax is regressive, which we may or may not agree on here, um, but sales tax in the highest court county is at 8%. So please explain to me how it is that this slide was derived and mathematically calculated to be higher than sales tax when that is the number that you're using. Assemblyman Hafen and uh, Mr. Guzman, I'm going to jump in right now because I think there is confusion over slide three. The title of it is the share of family income, and I don't think it's suggesting an actual tax. It's... Sorry, Madam Chair, I just want clarification for the record because it's very confusing to me that what they just stated is that they're talking about sales tax and the effective tax rate. Um, and so I'd like an explanation of how these numbers were actually calculated because to me, the math doesn't add up. So if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're asking for then is exactly how the study was done as to the different taxes. Is that what I'm understanding you asking for? Uh, yeah, I'd like to know how you came up with an effective tax rate of 10.2% when groceries, rent, health insurance are not taxed because at $20,000 a year you're collecting Medicaid um, and sales tax in the highest tax county is only 8%. So to me, the math doesn't add up. And so I would greatly appreciate an explanation of how it is possible to get an effective tax rate higher than the actual rate. Mr. Guzman, would you like to oh. explain the where where the information comes from again? And if not, then I'm more than happy to sit down and the three of us can also meet if you like, Assembly Member Haven. Sure, uh, just I'll say briefly, um, for this report, we take, uh, we compile the tax liabilities of personal income taxes, corporate income taxes, uh, sales and excise taxes uh, and property taxes. Um, and within those broad categories, we have, you know, we slot the state's various taxes into those different buckets and uh, we determine their tax liability uh, based on that. Um, so it's, this 10% figure is not just indicative of the sales tax, the impact of the sales tax. It's indicative of the, uh, all of the taxes in Nevada and how they impact 
uh, folks in the lowest income uh, bracket. And also I'm happy to share our, our methodology again and um, sit down and, and speak further about this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we'll go on to um, Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. I want to build a little bit on what my fellow Assemblyman said on uh, taxes. And I have read and have heard repeatedly, and, and I would probably agree that sales tax is somewhat regressive uh, to the lower incomes. But Mr. Guzman, in your factoring, getting to, um, what is it, slide three, in um, your work there, and maybe it'll be clarified when we get your material, but you know, we have a very strong tourism industry here in Nevada. I'm not sure where you're located and what information you may have, but, and they probably pay a good percentage of our sales tax. That's one reason why the state historically has looked at sales taxes to let the tourists pay for that. That includes also things as room tax, et cetera. So I, part of that 10.2, your descending numbers there, that's what I'm asking. Were, were any of that factored in? And then I have a follow-up to that. Uh, but could you tell me, was the tourism input, those tourists' dollars, factored into your numbers here? Uh, I, I can't answer that specifically. Um, likely, it, it, they were not. Um, this focus is primarily on the residents of Nevada and the impact on them specifically. You're correct that a portion of the sales tax is exported out to out-of-state residents who come in and purchase things in the state, but uh, this specific report focuses uh, specifically on Nevada residents. And if, if I could also add the Assembly Member Anderson, Please. I really appreciate you bringing in the tourism area because I do think we also need to do that sort of study or what sort of impact um, tourism has on our tax structure. And although that is not mentioned and is a little bit outside the purview of what this, it is outside the purview of that. I do think it's an important thing for us also to consider with a long conversation that could happen over the interim. Because I do think that's one more element and why we need to have a conversation and not just automatically here it is. Because that sort of variable is very important for us to know about in our state and how we attract individuals to our state for that very reason. So again, that's why I'm trying to get this as a study or a way for us to discuss it. Because those elements need to be also considered. And then I think you had a follow up as well. Yeah, I think that discussion on tourism paying to, uh, our sales tax has been had for several years now and why we are where we are to some extent. But the next part, I think you said, you know, with, or it was mentioned by my fellow assemblyman, um, things, uh, food, uh, groceries, there are a variety of those necessary elements that we all have to buy at whatever income we may have, the same thing. I buy a carton of eggs, a dozen eggs, I'm paying the same price that someone that may earn considerably less, more, less money than I do or considerably more money than I do. But that's tax exempt. But my guess is that, and somewhat personally having gone out with friends of mine who earn considerably more than I do, they'll buy items that have a, that cost considerably more, i.e. a vehicle, buy a Mercedes, buy, and I, sh I, I, nothing against Mercedes, they're wonderful cars. <clears throat> uh, buy a higher price vehicle than a used lower price vehicle that you would pay a different tax on. And so that's part of that discretionary spending, I, I I'm just confused by some of your numbers. Um, those earning less income are not forced to buy a higher price vehicle and pay that higher tax, just as I'm not, or as I usually buy a used vehicle. So I can get it for a less price, pay lower taxes. So it, it gets back to the discretionary spending. That's what we're really doing with our sales tax. We make choices and how, what we buy and what we're gonna pay for it and in turn that tax. And so I, I 
I do question your numbers. I'd like to look forward to seeing how you factored in some of the things we've just discussed here. And if I'm not mistaken, the Arizona tax that you mentioned in here was actually run by the education, I think, by an education group to fund strictly education alone. It was not a generalized tax to bring in more revenue. Um, so I'm looking forward to those numbers. I'm disappointed that you did not bring in some of that uh, expenditures by tourism uh, to your numbers, and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Next, we will move to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you both for the presentation. Can you get into the study and just um, for people who might be watching and aren't really familiar the way we do things in the interim and what those meetings are like and accessibility for the public, that type of thing? Thank you so much for the question, Assemblymember Anderson. Um, so, uh, and I might need help from the chair as well with this because I've only uh, served one interim. But what happens is the committee would meet and it would be members of both parties as well as members that were, and they're all appointed by our chair as well as our minority leader from the assembly and then also the same thing on the Senate side. And so this would be a group of 12 to 15 people usually. I'm looking for guidance on that one, who would meet then probably about every month, every other month or so, and there would be an agenda set by the chair. During those studies, we would be able to actually create or discuss these items. This would all be done very similar to the legislature, where it is open meetings such as this. People are able to come in and watch things. They're able to question as well. Um, it is structured in the same fashion. But again, I have not, I've only served in one term and it was, we were still working through a little bit with more with that. So I didn't know if legal also wanted to add more or if other people that have more experience would like to add more to that. For those playing along with um, legislature bingo, would you like to say that there would be a deep dive of these issues to be addressed? No, and, and, and in all seriousness, yeah, it's a, it's a chance to, to, um, to spend more time addressing the issues, not in the rush of a 120-day session, but it is, as you said, it's agendized, it's uh, open to the public, and, and people can call in, they can make comments, they can come to Grant Sawyer or come here and continue to participate in those meetings. So, Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Next, we'll move to Assemblyman Gray. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Assemblywoman uh, Anderson, for wanting to have the discussion and stuff. But you touched on something, and anybody let me know if I hit on a legislative bingo, but you touched on something that I, uh, you know, really, it drives me up a wall every time I hear about it. You know, equal tax share, fair tax share, things like that. You know, I want to know what leads you to believe, and let me tell you, I am nowhere near that top 20% bracket. So, but, you know, dollar for dollar, I mean, the top 1%, you know, the top 15%, I mean, that whole group, they spend more in sales taxes. Um, they buy, you know, they have a lot more dis disposable income. They provide jobs. They, you know, they pay taxes on their businesses, you know, in a lot of, in, well, in most cases, in those things. And they usually take nothing from the system. They have their own health care. They've got their own retirements. I mean, they've got all those things. What, you know, I'm sorry, what on earth leads you to believe it's not, you know, equal or, you know, I, I would counter that it's wholly unequal because they get nothing in return for the money that they do spend in taxes. Thank you for the, for the question. And, and I, would, I would disagree with you to an extent. I am in that boat of the other individuals who, who basically, I do believe that many of the individuals who are, who are making the billion dollars have 90% of the time uh, inherited that and also have not been, in fact, always investing in our state as much as they would like um, I, or as much as we need to help. I mean, when I take a look at some of the federal guidelines and I see, I mean, I, excuse me, I keep on saying that word. Uh, we've seen billionaires say, why is my legal secretary having to pay more in taxes than I do? It is that idea. It is why this is being brought forward. It is based upon uh, the survey as well as others, which basically state we need to start figuring out how to expand 
our revenue sources. We need to we need to stop depending upon one or two industries and start really looking at each other. And are we truly helping each other? And this is one one way to do so. And again, this has to do with discussion. Are we truly helping each other? And the people that have inherited taxes that dis, or inherited money that make the decision to stay in our state, which we love that they do, but the believed to be, perceived to be, uh, 27 people, that 2%, do you know how many schools that could build? How many roads that could help us with? How many police officers, firefighters, we could continue on with that what if situation. But until we actually have a discussion, it's just gonna be at a what if world. And at some point we gotta start doing something. And this is a chance for us to do so. Follow on, please, Madam Chair. Um, what if these people then decide to take themselves and their businesses to another state that's more tax friendly and they take those jobs with them? Why don't we look for other ways to encourage business, cut taxes, you know, take advantage of economies of scale and do things that'll actually, you know, encourage other people to get wealthy and provide jobs and, you know, buy more things, you know, keep it spinning that way instead of really penalizing those who have done well. And, you know, even if they've inherited it somewhere along the way, somebody worked hard for that money and that's their, their goose egg. I mean, their, their, uh, their nest egg, but you know, it's uh, and, and I would still say that those people are probably still giving back more than they're taking. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, they're not partaking in a lot of the public services. You know, they're spending, like I said, more on their cars. Somebody brought that up. I mean, their sales tax, they're paying more in sales tax a lot of times than most of us make in a year on one item. More than likely you're right on that one. Uh, and thank you. Um, quite frankly, we already are doing that. And that, those items have been with GoEd. We already are investing in many of these companies. We already are doing this as a state. And it has been very helpful. I don't want to make, make it sound like it has not. But this is a, we continue to have issues around helping us invest in each other. We have to have discussions. There is nothing wrong with us having a long, deep dive discussion. This bill does not actually create it. This bill is having us have the discussion so people can have a, a different opinion and we can sit down and talk about it. Because at this time, we continue to talk about it in our restaurants. We talk with our neighbors, literally. I had a friend of mine who obviously same political background, same other beliefs, and definitely not in the billionaire's tax area. But we would go for a walk, I guess it was about two weeks ago, excited about this possibility. That's what this is about, is us having a discussion, not automatically saying, yes, we're going to do it. No, we're not going to do it. Automatically. This is a chance for us to consider it. That's all that this is asking to do with this study and with this discussion over the interim. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Anderson. One thing is, is I know people may be looking at our minutes or looking back at this hearing, and I just wanted to make sure um, since the last legislative session, um, there were a lot of discussions about the standing committee. And just for our record, I'd make sure that we were aware of NRS 218E.0, which was the creation of our interim um, committees. It changed slightly last session um, in that each committee would have eight regular members and five alternative members, and the way those members are selected are set forth in that statute. With that, I'll go ahead and um, go to Assemblywoman Gallant. Thank you, Chair. Um, coming from somebody um, who left California for some of this similar thought process and They've all gone to Florida and Texas, and they've come to Nevada a little bit. Um, I think this feels or appears misleading uh, because I think what you're, because I keep hearing impact. Um, so are these numbers based on, based on how much this person makes, they're paying 10% of their income on sales tax. Am I reading this correctly? No. Okay, so you're stating that they pay 10% of the tax collected in Nevada? Because I, I want to make sure what we're measuring first. Are, are you looking at slide three or are you looking at? Yeah. Okay. 
I'm going to have Mr. Guzman discuss that. But in you know this what? Bill. I'm just going to interfere Oops, right sorry. here because this is the third time this question has come up. Because of time limits, I'm going to suggest that those members that have questions, I'm sure um, Assemblywoman Anderson and Mr. Guzman would be happy to sit down and explain how the source of family income slide is derived. So let's move along. I'm going to move to Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for this. I appreciate that it's a study so that we can figure it out. Um, and I actually think you might have answered it, but in in your research, were you able to see how many people this would impact? Excellent question, and I'm more than happy to meet individually or even with the entire Republican caucus, if you like. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, thank you for asking that question. From the understanding of um, a few individuals who have looked into it, the numbers have ranged between 17 and 27. Um, and just to put that again in, in um, perspective or just to be a reality, my largest class last semester, I'm sorry, my smallest class last semester was 33 students. That is less, I have more students in my first period class of six classes than there are billionaires in, this, in our state. And yet they would help us in many ways. So I just want to put that in the room as well to consider. OK, thank you. Um, right now, we're going to thank you so much for your presentation. Um, if the two of you want to um, step back for a moment, we'll go ahead and move on to take testimony in support of ACR 7. Madam Chair, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, the voice of Nevada educators for over 120 years. NSA, NSEA supports ACR 7 to direct the interim revenue, uh, interim revenue to study wealth taxes. Uh, for decades, Nevada has ranked near the bottom of states in education funding and quality. In the 2021 Quality Counts report from Education Week, Nevada dropped to 49th in school finance, uh, tied for 49th in the overall chance for success index. Uh, we know that Nevada has the largest class sizes in the country, a direct result of chronic underfunding. We know there are thousands of educator uh, vacancies related to uh, not paying educators enough. In 2019, uh, the legislature created the Commission on School Funding, tasked that commission with studying what it would take for Nevada to reach optimal funding uh, in the next 10 years, accounting for historic increases to K-12 funding recommended in the governor's budget uh, this, for this upcoming biennium, Nevada would still need to raise an additional $2.6 billion per year to reach optimal funding by fiscal year 33, as determined by the Commission on School Funding. In response to the governor's budget recommendation, NSCA has been asking, now what? Because in future fiscal years, Nevada is unlikely to have the record revenues we've seen in the last couple of years. This is why it is still necessary to pursue revenue streams for public education and other critical public services. Last year, NSEA served nearly 700 educators across the state, asking them to rank nine possible proposals to raise revenue for public education. A wealth tax was by far the most popular of the proposals. It had an average weight of 4.35 out of 5. Increasing the sales tax, uh, on the other hand, received the lowest rating of 2.04 out of 5. Educators, like most Nevadans, are more likely to support more progressive revenue proposals. We strongly encourage that uh, Nevada join other states in pursuing a wealth tax to make sure those with the most resources share equitably to fund governmental services. Thank you very much. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Maria Teresa Lieberman Parraga, M A R I A hyphen T E R E S A L I E B E R M A N N hyphen P A R R A G A. I'm the Deputy Director of Battleborn Progress. We strongly support this resolution and thank the Assemblywoman for bringing it forward. This is not about taxing hardworking Nevadans. It's about understanding wealth and figuring out how those who may not be paying their fair share do so, because this is a systemic problem that both the national level and the state levels need to figure out. Now, I am not wealthy, 
But when I filed my taxes just a few days ago, I paid less in taxes than my mother, a housekeeper. People who have their wealth tied up in the stock market pay even less. I'd like to thank someone who cleaned 16 hotel rooms on the Strip for over 25 years contributes just as much or more to this state than someone who makes more but pays less in taxes than her. Now, that is not equal. And sometimes we like to make fun of California, me even at times because I'm from there. But when I was there, I had much better schools. I had parks nearby. I had better roads when I was in San Diego as a kid. So maybe we should take note. The questions and comments, not only in this committee, but throughout this building, this session on how do we pay for this, how do we pay for that, and making sure it's not on the backs of hardworking Nevadans is why we need this study. If we want to stop being last in education funding, one of the worst states for health care, and all the other bad lists, we must support this resolution. Pass ACR 7. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Tess Opferman. I am here on behalf of the Human Services Network and the Nevada Women's Lobby. Day after day at the legislature, you are faced with challenging conversations and difficult decisions when it comes to allocating limited funds. Do we allocate money to state jobs to address our state employment crisis? Do we allocate money to schools to make sure our students are able to learn in a positive and effective environment and our teachers and support staff make livable wages? Do we attempt to raise reimbursement rates and address a failing health care and mental health care system? We spend hour after hour dividing and subdividing a pie when really we need to think about the pie as a whole. At the end of the day, all the pots need more funding. Schools, health care, state workers, parks, roads, and social support systems. We need to increase the pot as a whole, and to do that, we need all Nevadans to pay their fair sh share. In support... Uh, we support ACR 7 as an important step to ensure the state's wealthiest residents are paying a fair and logical amount in taxes. Our tax base should not be dependent on the lowest and middle class wage earners. We need to be collecting appropriate taxes from the entirety of the state base. This study will open the conversation so we can dive more deeply into the numbers and better understand a path forward for Nevada. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Carter Bundy with AFSCME. Um, we also encourage you to support ACR 7 and thank the sponsor for bringing it. State employees, as many of you have heard over and over this session, have been 20 to 30 percent behind county and city workers. We're well behind other states' employees, and that has resulted in 20 to 30 percent vacancy rates to provide core services that I believe every legislator in both chambers and both parties believes in, from public safety to infrastructure to HHS and taking care of our kids, uh, and of course, education. You don't get something for nothing. The money has to come from somewhere. And rather than increasing the tax burden on lower income and middle class Nevadans, I think it's fully worth at least exploring and studying whether there's another way to make sure that the billionaires, who I would argue do very much benefit from the public services in this state, whether their kids are going to schools or they're driving on our roads or they're taking advantage of a workforce that relies on public dollars for training, whether it's in school or uh, workforce training, those are tax dollars that help our richest Nevadans. So I hope you'll consider supporting ACR 7 so that we can diversify our revenue streams and, have, and fully fund all the services that Nevadans need. Thank you. Kent Irvin, Nevada Faculty Alliance. Uh, ditto to what some of the other speakers have said. I, I would like to discuss the fact that Nevada's tax structure is very volatile. It's focused on uh, a few kinds of taxes and a few major industries, and that makes it very volatile. During the Great Recession and during the pandemic, Nevada had some of the deepest drops in state revenue among states, and what happened then? Well, cuts had to be made. State government is lot largely about the employees that serve the public uh, in the state, including higher education, but also all the other employees, and so many of the cuts fell, immediate cuts on state employees, and then those are hard to bring back. We're trying hard, appreciate what the legislature this session is trying to do to 
correct the employment state employee crisis in the state, but part of the underlying reason is the volatility of our tax structure in the state. So it makes sense to study other ways we can bring in revenue from different kinds of sources like this wealth tax idea and it makes, certainly makes sense to study that. So we support ACR7. Thank you. Thank you so much. With that, we'll go to the phone lines. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line wishing to give testimony in support of ACR7? Callers, if you'd like to testify in support of ACR7, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Matthew Wilkie, for the record, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-W-I-L-K-I-E. -I, -E. I would like to thank the Assemblywoman for bringing this resolu resolution forward. Um, many of the, the things that I hear when I come home from work in a shift and watch these uh, meetings on YouTube, when I hear opposition is, where's the money? Where's the money? We don't have the money. I think we may have found it. Thank you so much for your time, and I urge you um, your support for this resolution. Thank you. Buenas tardes, Comité del Ingreso de la Asamblea. Mi nombre es Roberto Rentería y soy líder de Make Road. Nevada. Hoy estoy aquí pidiendo su firme apoyo para ACR7, que crea la oportunidad de investigar más acerca de los impuestos sobre la riqueza, más estos impuestos pueden generar ingresos para financiar y apoyar programas públicos que son esenciales para muchos residentes de Nevada, como las escuelas públicas. Por eso creo que ACR7 nos dará la oportunidad de encontrar diferentes maneras de crear un ingreso a través de impuestos sobre la riqueza para ayudar a financiar y apoyar programas públicos para nuestras comunidades sin afectar negativamente a nuestra gente. Hoy les insisto que apoyen la ACR7 y les agradezco que me escuchen. Gracias por su atención y espero que tengan una buena tarde. If we can go to the next caller. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, good afternoon. My name is Robert Garcia. I'm the economic business organizer here at Mesa Road, Nevada. I'm here to show my support for ACR7, which is a study can bring amazing potential to our state. Every day I see members of our community struggling to make ends meet, and when I go out looking for resources for them, either they have very limited or no funding available. Nevada writes itself on not having any income taxes, but that also means we have very limited sources of revenue. This study will allow the Joint Intermean Standing Committee on Revenue to learn more about the potential of wealth taxes and how they can uplift Nevada. More revenue can help fund public programs like education, welfare services, and more without hurting the pockets of low-income, working-class, and middle-class Nevadians. Tax breaks and abandonments for aviation, data centers, capital investments, and groups like Tesla and the Las Vegas Raider Stadium are taking away billions of dollars in, that could be used for funding public education and other public services. I urge you to support ACR7 to create better pathways for revenue and to up, help uplift and thrive all people who live in our state. Thank you so much. Hello, committee. This is Elise Monroy Marsala on behalf of the Nevada Public Health Association. The Nevada Public Health Association supports this study that would look at bringing in new sources of revenue to support um, social programs, including public health programs, hopefully, in Nevada. Thank you. 
BPS, I believe that was our last caller in support of ACR 4 7. Thank you, Chair. There are no more callers in support at this time. Perfect. With that, we'll move to testimony in opposition to ACR 7. Those wishing to give testimony in opposition to ACR 7, please make your way up to the dais and please start when you get up there. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Janine Hansen. I'm the state president of Nevada Families for Freedom. We don't want anybody's taxes to be increased. ACR 7 lays the foundation to raise taxes. The purpose of it is to expand revenue. We don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. We don't want more government or to grow it. Of course, people support uh, the opportunity to take other people's money in taxes and not their own. That's just obvious. We don't want uh, additional services. There will never be enough money for government. One concern I had was the statement that, what is their fair share? That is a scary idea when we have no definition. The bill talks about equitability. That's a concerning word because it doesn't mean equality. It doesn't mean it will be based on an equal basis. But what somebody else thinks that somebody has, if it's more, they'd like to get it. So that's a very uh, a poor word on a scary word when you consider what their fair share would be. We don't want to chase wealthy individuals out of our state. They provide jobs and uh, other opportunities, economic opportunities, for those that don't have the money to do that. Most European countries have concluded that wealth taxes are economically harmful and fiscally counterproductive. European countries imposed wealth taxes in 1996, but only three do today. They found out that it isn't productive for their communities, for their states, to impose taxes on the wealthy. We encourage you to um, help the middle class by cutting taxes and regulations in government, and we will all benefit from the increase in taxes that they will pay when you cut the initial taxes. Thank you. With that, we'll go to BPS. BPS, is there anyone on the phone line wishing to give testimony in opposition to ACR 7? Callers, if you'd like to testify in opposition to ACR 7, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Yes, this is Casey Rogers, for the record. Um, I absolutely oppose this, and I'm going to speak very frankly. As somebody who has studied sociology, I have to tell you right now that everything that is happening is done by design right now. Um, you could say COVID had two major goals. One was to kill and take away civil liberties and rights, and the other was to finish off the middle class. You know how many small businesses were killed because of this? When you start seeing the pattern and the puzzle come together, you should recognize when bills like this come forward, it's really a social, a socialism um, uh, idea. Let's just put it that way. That's, this is what they want to do. They want to study, study how much money they can take from other people and give to others. This is exactly what socialism is. Take from some, give to others. And what better way to see how much money they can take from billionaires and when you say that it's not fair, I can tell you right now, billionaires and millionaires spend more money than any of you have in taxes, and that's for sure. So when you say it's not fair, I think you're misinformed. And the last thing I would say is to a couple of your questions on your poll, I would like to know who took that poll, what age group, were they university students, were they indoctrinated with this kind of riffraff? Um, was it a political party? I, I see that you said it was di different political parties, but I would like to explore a little bit more into how you're polling people, because I can tell you right now, America wants to stay America, and the Democrats are trying to take it into something else. Thanks.
Good evening, committee. My name is Jim DeGraffenry, D-E-G-R-A-F-F-E-N-R-E-I-D. I'm Nevada's Republican National Committee man, representing the Nevada Republican Party in opposition to Assembly Concurrent Resolution 7. Instead of working to reduce the tax burden on hardworking Nevadans, Democrats in this body are once again trying to push through a tax-the-rich scheme under the guise of a wealth tax study. ACR 7 cites the city population growth of Nevada, but a significant part of that growth comes from California residents fleeing the high-tax policies of California. California has lost population every year since 2020, and in fact, enough Californians have fled to cause the loss of a congressional seat for the first time in their history. How many of these Californians would Nevada attract with a wealth tax? Perhaps those productive future Nevadans would instead choose Texas or Florida, both of which have education systems ranked in the top 10 to complement their lack of income and wealth taxes. Does Nevada really want to put ourselves in the position of encouraging productive residents to live somewhere else? ACR 7 recycles the tired, misleading, and dishonest talking point that wealthy individuals don't share equitably in the responsibility of funding governmental services. IRS data proves that wealthy individuals, on the contrary, pay far more than their fair share. While the top 1% wealthiest taxpayers receive 20% of income, they pay 40% of all taxes. It's fundamentally unfair to further tax these individuals a second time on wealth after they pay 40% of their income in taxes generating that wealth. ACR 7 paints an unrealistic picture of the revenue that could be generated by targeting a minority of voters who have a choice to either stay or pay or not. Instead, it should ask how many productive Nevadans would permanently leave for a state with no wealth tax and then who would pay these taxes. It's telling that Democrats seek to punish success rather than try and reduce the regressive tax burden on low-income Nevadans. Republicans have consistently advocated for sales tax holidays on school supplies to help working families, a reduction of sales tax for Nevadans who register their car with proof of insurance, and stopping the army of IRS agents targeting tipped workers. The Democrats are silent on all these issues and more that would stand up for hardworking Nevada families. Please reject this resolution that will cause Nevada to repeat the failures of California and the other excess tax states mentioned earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of this committee. My name is Alita Benson, Executive Director of the Nevada Republican Party, testifying on behalf of the Nevada Republican Party in opposition to ACR 7. We included in our written testimony a throwback picture of Nevada we hope you'll look at. It shows Nevada with no income tax, no sales tax, no tax in general, being touted as a point of pride. This picture is from 1949, but there's no reason it can't become a reality today. Instead of trying to reduce the tax burden on the working class Nevadans, Democrats in this body are once again trying to push through an income tax. This resolution cites the continuous population growth of Nevada. A significant part of that population growth comes from California residents fleeing the high-tax policies of California. Why would they come to Nevada when we emulate the failed policies of the state they are seeking to leave? This resolution seeks to look at the potential revenue that could be generated by targeting a minority of voters. Why does it not study how many high-income Nevadans would permanently leave our state if this is passed? Democrats in this body, who consistently advocate for the greater good, seem to forget that the smallest minority in the world is the individual. The tax on a millionaire today is a tax on the tipped worker tomorrow. Let's return Nevada to the picture above and throw any hint of an income tax into the shredder where it belongs. Please vote no on ACR 7. C Y R U S H O J J A T Y. I'd like to thank the sponsors for bringing this very important issue. Income inequality is out of control. This is our main economic problem. Much of the wealth is going to the very few large corporations and wealthy individuals. Progressive taxation has a lot of benefits, a lot of economic out. And by the way, I'm very surprised I'm not hearing much from culinary or plant, believe it or not. However, there are some concerns when you have very high taxes. Lots of people move away. Growth starts to slow down. Up until the 2000s, Nevada was the fastest growing state. Today, we're no longer in the top 10. I'm also a refugee from California. And unlike some people who testified in support who come from San Francisco, and you could see what a mess these cities have become, believe it or not. The fact is, is that People flee the high-taxed areas, and money follows. And I, by the way, I would actually support this bill if you were to lower other taxes. 
because we've constantly raised taxes in the name of education, sales, marijuana, commerce, mining. And what's our ranking? Where have we gone? Seriously. In fact, we can just eliminate sales taxes except for the tourist areas. And we can make the same argument about gaming taxes. We're the lowest gaming taxes in the entire country. And if you put this wealth tax, I have about 13 years experience in the stock market, did remarkably well, did going to impact me. And my wealth is projected to increase over time. I want to start a company here. So I would urge you to reconsider this bill. If you're going to increase our taxes, lower others. Otherwise, growth is going to fail. The construction industry is going to decline. And who knows, man, we might be on the path of becoming the next Detroit. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Teresa DeGraffenried, D-E-G-R-A-F-F-E-N-R-E-I-D. I'm speaking um, for myself on behalf of myself. I am opposed to ACR 7, not because I am rich in need or want to cheat the state of Nevada out of taxes that, they, that are due. I am not rich now or have ever been. My parents were lower middle class both working in a time when mothers never worked outside the home. It sickens me how jealous people are of the rich. Though my parents were poor by some standards, they always taught us to reach for the stars and not to be jealous of others because of what they had and not um, and didn't teach us to, um, to not... Uh, they wanted us to reach for the stars and to become rich ourselves. Proposing to tax rich people into oblivion is not where we should be headed. We need to encourage new business to come to our state and encourage people to bring their wealth to our state so that they don't go to another state to make um, their wealth. Um, we need to find other ways to make money for the state. And like another person said, we have a spending problem, not a money problem. Thank you. And again, vote no on ACR 7. Thank you so much. Callers, Next. if you've recently joined and would like to testify in opposition of ACR 7, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you so much. Next, we will move on to testimony in the neutral. Um, anyone in Carson City having neutral testimony to ACR 7, please come forward. Okay, BPS, do we have anyone on the phone line wishing to give testimony in the neutral to ACR 7? Callers, if you'd like to testify in neutral for ACR 7, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you so much. With that, we will invite the bill sponsor back to the front and for any closing remarks. Thank you again for um, having this hearing. I greatly appreciate it. During the opposition, there was a few questions that I wanted to um, answer. Uh, one of them had to do with the age breakdown of the survey that I was utilizing. Uh, the age breakdown, there's 64% that were over the age of 40. Uh, that was, again, self-reported. And then also um, a question about the income rates. 58% uh, uh, self-reported income, $75,000 or more higher that they make in a year. So just wanted to also um, say that I heard the opposition. I wanted to make sure that everybody also had that other information. And obviously, I'm more than happy to meet with anyone about questions that they may have. Thank you so much again. Hope you have a lovely Tuesday night. Thank you so much. With that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on ACR 7, and we will go ahead and open the hearing on Assembly Bill 445. If Assemblywoman Newby would like to come forward, um, please feel free to start when you are ready.
Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and esteemed colleagues on the Assembly Revenue Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present AB 445, and thank you also to Speaker Yeager for sparing me a leadership bill to bring this topic forward. In October 2022, the United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division issued a report on their investigation of Nevada's use of institutions to serve children with behavioral health disabilities. In short, the DOJ found that, quote, Nevada does not provide its children with behavioral health disabilities with adequate community-based services. Instead, Nevada relies on segregated institutional settings like hospitals and residential treatment facilities to serve children with behavioral health disabilities. The DOJ report, and I, um, I sent it in, so it is as uh, one of the exhibits to this bill. I highly recommend that you read it if you haven't, but prepare yourself. Maybe a glass of wine goes well or better with it. Uh, the DOJ report chronicles the cycle of helplessness. Without community-based services, children get sent to the emergency room for behavioral health issues. After several of those visits, the children then get sent to residential for at least nine months and often over a year and often out of state. Bouncing between facilities, children can cumulatively spend years away from home. Parents report that they want access to community-based services to help their children from being, uh, to keep their children from being institutionalized, but feel they have no choice between this because the services simply aren't there. The DOJ even documented parents relinquishing their children to the child welfare or juvenile justice system based on the belief that children receive more services through these public systems. Imagine being a parent and needing to make that choice. Reading this report, my disappointment in Nevada's mental health services turned to anger over our abject failure in supporting these children. And in that moment, I remembered a line I've always loved from an Ani DeFranco song. You didn't think there was gonna be an Ani DeFranco quote today, did you? But here it is. Every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. And so AB 445 does just that, by taking some of our traditional tools that we have used in Nevada, and it repurposes them to help solve this crisis in children's behavioral health. These include go-ed tax abatements, Nevada Educational Choice Scholarships, also known as Opportunity Scholarships, the Infrastructure Bank, and the regulatory process. So I will go through the bill and talk a little bit about how it does that. First, AB 445 takes the tax abatements traditionally used by the Governor's Office of Economic Development, or GOED, and applies it to businesses which provide mental health services for children. Sections one through four of the bill outline much of the same process that GOED currently follows with a few key differences. Instead of the tax abatement process starting with the local economic development organizations like LVGEA or EDON, the process starts with the two largest counties, Clark County, Washoe County, or the Department of Health and Human Services. Also, AB 445 replaces the relatively open recruitment of businesses with a specific list of services that must be provided, which can be found in Section 1, Subsection 2H. Finally, um, Section 1, Subsection 13 allows the business that has successfully received a partial abatement to apply to DHHS for a cost-based uh, reimbursement rate, which is the tool that is currently applied to the Nevada Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers. The second tool that AB 445 uses is uh, taking the first part of the process established for the Nevada Educational Choice Scholarships, also known as Opportunity Scholarships. It repurposes it to generate additional funding to support Medicaid rates for children's mental health. In Section 5, those of you familiar with the Opportunity Scholarships will recognize the process by which businesses can donate to a fund uh, 
to receive credit against the modified business tax. In AB 445, this account created for this purpose is the account to improve mental health services for children. And businesses work not with the Department of Education, like in opportunity scholarships, but with the Department of Health and Human Services. The cap on donations in AB 445 is $5 million. Uh, I'm okay with that, but I would also like to see the cap for children's mental health services mirror the cap for opportunity scholarships, which in fiscal year 23 was 6655000 also, though I have not been able to speak with the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy regarding this, my hope is that these funds, once collected, would be eligible for the federal Medicaid match. Third, in Section 9, AB 445 clarifies the definition of so social infrastructure to include facilities providing mental health services to our children so that the Nevada State Infrastructure Bank would be a clear possible use of funds. To be clear, we, uh, in speaking with the um, treasurer's office, they believe that mental health facilities would fall under that definition now, but AB 445 makes it abundantly clear. Finally, AB 445 requires the Department of Health and Human Services to review regulations to ideally streamline the licensing process to further encourage service providers to locate or expand in Nevada. Often when governments are looking to encourage new businesses, they take a look at what regulations or red tape may be making it difficult for businesses to locate there. Based on the feedback from stakeholders, streamlining the application process for facilities with multiple kinds of services and ensuring continuity of these services was an area we believed we could improve upon. That's an overview of AB 445. I'd be happy to answer any questions or phone a friend. Thank you so much with, for your presentation, Assemblywoman Newby. Um, we will go ahead and start with Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for this. I just had um, a quick, actually two quick clarifying questions. Would this um, apply to both nonprofits and for-profits, and does it also include those that are already in our state, or is it abatements for out-of-state? Thank you. Uh, through the Chairwoman to you, Assemblywoman Mosca, um, those are great questions. And in fact, um, there's sort of a mix in this bill of um, options. Some of these abatements are really targeted toward private sector providers, and some of them are for uh, nonprofit. So for example, um, the tax abatements that come through GoEd, that would be for a private sector provider. Um, because nonprofits necessarily don't necessarily pay the taxes, right? And so, um, likewise, for infrastructure bank, uh, I believe that's only open to government and nonprofit entities. So, there's a mix understanding that there are both for profit providers and nonprofit providers and governmental providers um, in this space. The second part of your question is whether or not it's for in-state or out-of-state. I'm really looking at both. Um, in my research about uh, health, mental health providers, I found uh, providers in other states who have multiple locations and branches. And so it would be trying to attract some of those as well as encouraging providers that are already in our state to perhaps expand. Thank you so much. Next, we will go to Assembly Men Orlinkter. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Assemblywoman. I love the philosophy of this bill to try to use all these tools. This is really great creative thinking. The one question I have is on the incentives for for-profit programs. There are a number of areas with in the in social services where the move from not-for-profit to for-profit hasn't worked so well. And so do we have to worry here? Do we know, I don't know enough about for-profit providers in this area, but is this cause for concern that we all have shift from not-for-profit to for-profit? 
Thank you, Assemblyman. Through the uh, chairperson to you, um, I get that, and that concerns me as well. When I was looking at the DOJ report, though, and as long as I've been in this building in any number of different capacities, we have really failed at mental health services. And so in my mind, it's it's a form of four alarm fire. And um, whether it's nonprofits or for profits, I think we just need to get those services here. Now, I'm anticipating that because the application for those for-profit tax abatements would come through the counties, the counties or DHHS would do that vetting and then submit them to GoEd to, uh, to go through the rest of the, the tax abatement process, that on the front end, ideally the counties or DHHS and their human services departments would kind of vet some of the, the actors that they're willing to uh, put forward as applications. So I'm hoping that that is the case. And then of course, DHHS still has oversight, um, I believe in all these mental health facilities. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Assembly Men Nguyen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was really excited to look at just more avenues to help our mental health services, for, especially for children. I'm wondering, as I was reading through this, is there um, a particular focus? Um, I know that you talked about earlier on private um, providers as well as um, uh, in-state, out-of-state with the with the Summerman Mosca's question. But I was wondering, in terms of courting private institution that can provide um, additional training, because we also, at the same time, have shortage in, 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 in access to services, but also shortage in educating uh, the mental health workforce as well. So I wonder if this is also targeting a uh, private institution that may offer um, educational degrees within Nevada that could uh, help with the shortage and be able to participate in this types of incentive as well. Thank you for the question through the chairwoman to you, Assemblyman uh, Wynn. Uh, currently, the way the bill is uh, is written, it is actually for the provision of particular services. So it's facilities and provision of the services that are enumerated there. So it wouldn't necessarily go toward a private educational institution. But I do have to acknowledge that in this session, we have a number of great pieces of legislation, in my opinion, that are being uh, considered. I just came from legislative operations where we were hearing about the lottery, uh, which is also um, aimed at children's mental health, at least uh, for now. And um, and then there's also AB 37, which I have to give a shout out to because that really addresses that um, pipeline of professionals to get more professionals here and grow more of our own. Quick follow-up statement, Chair. So I think that's hopefully that I could work with you on on maybe expanding that, if that was not the intent, is that uh, as much as we see um, uh, opportunities for these uh, facilities, at the same time, when we go through um, educational institution and encourage more educational institution that could provide that uh, accelerated um, education right here in Nevada, that would be also helpful so that we can uh, help with the frontline shortages and create more opportunities for a uh, private institution to offer uh, mental health uh, degrees here in our state as well. So I look forward to working with you on that. Likewise, thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Newby. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. With that committee members, do we have any further questions? We'll go to Assemblyman um, O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. And I want to thank Assemblywoman Newby for bringing forward a very interesting proposal. But I've got a, I, I'm not sure where I see GOED 
all, in some of the comments, our real issue with mental health is we don't have providers. Um, you're, if I understand, you would be talking about a brick and mortar facility. And a brick and mortar facility without providers is just a building. And, and from my experience, most mental or most medical providers, services, uh, their corporations are nonprofit. So I guess I, I've got several questions. One, where has this type of proposal, because other states give abatements, et cetera, to um, bring in various industries to their states, respective states. Do you know where this is, or a similar format as this has been practiced and has been successful in, in bringing? Because I, I, I'm confused. I really think the issue is we need medical, mental health providers, which we are working on right now um, to bring here. Uh, thank you for the question through the chairwoman to uh, Assemblyman O'Neill. Uh, I, I do have a phone a friend, I think, who is willing to pitch in, but I will start with this. Um, we need all of it. We need all of it. Uh, there are, um, I, I cut it out of my presentation, but there are uh, so many of our children who need uh, inpatient care, uh, residential treatment facilities, and so many of them are not kept in state. They're as far away as Missouri and North Carolina, and that's just not conducive um, to the relationship with the families. Uh, we also need step-down facilities. So when someone, when a child is released from a residential treatment facility, where do they go to, to then reintegrate? Um, and we also do need providers. And I think with the GoEd example, um, it was really my thought that if it works for us to bring major corporations, I won't name names, to Nevada, then I would be fine poaching uh, s providers and, and service, uh, 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 mental health service providers from other states as well. So why don't we just get into this game and start being as as I hate to say cutthroat, but as you know, as aggressive to f solve this problem that we have, that we've been in so many other areas. But GOA does not deal with nonprofits. Nonprofits don't pay the majority of these taxes. You're talking about abatements on. That's correct. So that's one of the taxes that, or one of the avenues, and this is a series of, of avenues and options, that one would be for a, a private provider. That would not be for a, a public sector or a nonprofit provider, just like the infrastructure bank would not be for a private provider. Okay, that, now I clarify. And if I may just ask for a clarification, Chair. You had spoken at one time about providing these to out-of-state Businesses, I assume you mean out-of-state businesses that are coming to Nevada, not that are operating out-of-state and giving them some kind of tax break or whatever assistance. I was confused on your statement a little bit, and I appreciate your friend now coming forward to help about the other, the other part of my question, but that I did misunderstand you, correct? Yes, uh, I would never say that you misunderstood me, but um, what I meant to say is that uh, there are out-of-state providers that we would recruit yeah. to come here, build a facility, start, bring their workers, bring their you know mental health providers, and locate them here. And uh, I, I believe Mr. Musgrove uh, represents such a client, so I'll turn it over to him for that perspective, Thank if you. that's all right with Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is really bad today, so I apologize. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to your question, and Dan Musgrove, for the record, representing um, Universal Health Services, which uh, includes the Valley Health System and Northern Nevada Medical System. 
as well as a number of behavioral health hospitals here in the state of Nevada. And in fact, um, tragically, we had to close West Hills Hospital in Reno, and we're currently in the process of closing Desert Springs because for one reason, those facilities are so out of date that the, the money to put into those facilities to bring them up to code um, was just cost prohibitive. But one of the things that Universal is doing is we've purchased purchased an assisted living center in Reno, and we're in the process of transforming that into a behavioral health hospital. But the cost of changing that kind of facility into a suicide-proof um, type of facility that meets the state standards to be a mental health facility is very costly. And so um, to receive a potential tax abatement to 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 kind of mitigate the fact that, and I think many of you know, Nevada's Medicaid rates are very lean, especially when it comes to mental health. Um, and so it's hard to kind of build in some of those costs into a mental health rate. So if somehow we could offset those capital costs by receiving tax abatements. I think um, you would see not only in-state providers looking into going into that business because it's, again, very costly to create a, a, a safe mental health facility. Um, but you'd also give the opportunity for, as the assemblywoman said, out-of-state providers who've looked at Nevada's Medicaid rate and said, we just can't afford to operate here in this state. At least it gives them kind of a balancing act of, if we can save some money here, then perhaps we can, we can make that Medicaid rate work for us because we're not having to spend so much in capital costs. And I think that's why it's so attractive and such a, an excellent kind of idea to try to put another tool, as she said, a weapon in our toolbox to, to attract folks who might normally never either get into behavioral health space or even consider coming to Nevada um, to build those kinds of facilities that, again, are very cost prohibitive. So I hope that kind of answers the question. It did to some extent. I'm still waiting for how many other states have used such a practice to attract businesses. I'm not aware of any, again, Dan Musgrove, I'm not aware of any, and I think that's why it's such an excellent idea and something that we as Nevada ought to explore because we are, we are losing the battle and attracting folks to the state for whatever reason it might be. Madam Chairwoman, to answer that question, um, when I had asked LCB if other states were doing this, uh, they came up empty-handed. I think we're probably, we would potentially be the first. Can I just, I promise one more? I promise. So with that in mind, what would you think about if this bill passed, adding or doing an amendment to it about if they don't come, it doesn't continue, it sunsets and goes away? Just as a thought, I'm trying to talk. I, I don't know what I'm saying, maybe. I'd consider that. I'd be happy to work with anyone who has any comments or thoughts on the bill. I appreciate it. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Next, we'll go to Assemblyman Haven. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you both for being here today. Um, uh, you had mentioned in Section 4 um, how this would uh, interact with the Opportunity Scholarships, uh, and so I just wanted to clarify on the record that um, you're not trying to use the Opportunity Scholarship funds. Um, this would be in addition to um, those funds, correct? Uh, through Madam Chairwoman to you, Assemblyman Hafen, uh, you are correct. And um, my reference to Opportunity Scholarships really was only to say that it is again, a recognized tool that we have in Nevada. And so this doesn't have any scholarships, but it repurposes that front part of that process to allow for the donations, the abatement of the modified business tax to uh, get the money into a special account for a special use. But no, it does not in any way usurp or change or take over opportunity scholarships. Thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Last, we'll go to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you um, for the presentation. Um, 
And I really do appreciate your thinking outside of the box with this, and because, um, as you said, it's a it's a work for alarm fire status. Um, and and I don't know if you addressed this, but I, and, and I missed it, and I might have been because I was, I read this last night, and so this afternoon as you started, I was kind of going through some of my notes. But in section one sub three, you've got the um, the specific years, the fifteen years. Can you talk more about that? It's, you know, we had a presentation, um, I don't know if it was this committee, I'm, I'm just losing days. We're at the part of session where you're just losing days. But we, uh, I think it was in judiciary where we were talking about the length of time that most businesses are open in Nevada. And we were talking about, I think it was six years for corporation and eight years for an LLC. And so I see this for the 15 years and it makes me think, how are we going to know that these businesses are going to stay open? Um, I do know, I know you have that language about finding the successors, but um, yeah, I just want to have you address that section a little more. Uh, thank you through the chairwoman to Assemblywoman Cohen. Um, that section really is lifted directly from our current uh, GOED uh, standards. And so I'm open to adjusting that time frame. Uh, really, what I wanted to do is just mirror it as much as I could. Um, so I believe that's the same that currently exists in GOED. And I, I don't pretend to know their processes about how they re-up and, and, and track those businesses to make sure that they're still in operation, but my understanding is that they do. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman um, um, Newby. I did want to just kind of put a comment, quick comment on the record. I get the privilege of representing kids and are um, subject to abuse and neglect, and RTCs are commonly utilized for that population, and unfortunately, it takes them away from their families or ability to stay a part of their village. So I appreciate your innovative efforts looking at this. I am going to step away, but I am going to turn it over to Vice Chair to kind of walk us through um, getting testimony and support and opposition. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we will move to those in support of Assembly Bill 445. If you want to come up to the table. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you for the second bite at the apple. Dan Musgrove. Um, here in a couple of hats. One, as an advocate, I am a current member and past chair of the Clark County Children's Mental Health Consortium. I want to certainly thank uh, the Assemblywoman for asking me to be a part of her stakeholder group. Um, it was an excellent discourse, and this was an idea that she walked in with, and we all thought that it was so intriguing and so again, out of the box that we thought that it ought to be considered. Um, I don't mind being Nevada first in some things, and we certainly ought to try. And so we are certainly very supportive in, in looking at any way that we can attract folks to Nevada willing to help our kids. Because um, the assemblyman, the minority leader was absolutely right. We don't have enough providers, but they also need places in which to help those kids. Sometimes it's more than just residential treatment. Sometimes it's partial residential treatment. Um, sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's foster homes or congregate care, but sometimes there's costs involved that, that just aren't made up by the reimbursement rates. And so if there's any way that we can help those providers come to Nevada, I think that's something we ought to consider. And then again, you also heard me speak on behalf of a couple of clients that I represent who are certainly interested in expanding services and look as this as a way to, again, mitigate some of those low reimbursement rates. So we are absolutely supportive. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Good evening. Uh, Tess Opperman, for the record, here on behalf of the National Association of so Social Workers as well of the, as the Human Services Network. Um, we know that we have a children's behavioral health crisis here in Nevada. Our social workers know it. Our direct care providers are well aware of it. Um, we really appreciate Assemblywoman Newby's work on this issue. Um, I know she approached us early in session. She said this was a priority of hers, um, and we're so grateful for this creative solution. We hope you pass this bill. Um, um, in an attempt to try to address this crisis that the state is facing. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee, Nicole Rourke representing the city of Henderson. Um, we'd also like to thank the sponsor for bringing this um, innovative bill uh, for a solution to our provider problem. Um, our children are our most vulnerable population, and so um, we really um, like this out-of-the-box thinking. It is aligned with our strategic plan in this area, um, and um, applaud her for this effort and urge you to support the bill. Thank you. Vice Chair, members of the committee, Jonathan Norman with the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers, which includes relevant to this, mostly Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada and Northern Nevada Legal Aid. We represent, you know, anywhere from three to 4,000 kids in foster care at any given time. And just to, you know, the DOJ report and the mental health crisis, how that plays out is, you know, our cap attorneys telling um, seven, eight-year-olds that they have to go to an RTC in Missouri. Um, and the kid asking, is Missouri close, right? And so when we talk about we're missing things from our service array, it's that. And then when the kid comes back and we don't have the appropriate step down, um, they're placed at Child Haven, they go acute again, and we, we recycle into the hospitalizations. Um, I was in a hearing earlier this week, I guess it's only Tuesday, so it must have been yesterday. Um, <laughs> And the um, Clark County Department of Family Services, I think they testified that within, it was within the last year, they've had 140 families in Clark County surrender their children to the Department of Family Services because they cannot get mental health um, treatment in the community. So they're looking to DFS as a provider of last resort for mental health. And, and then how that plays out is the, the children will be at Child Haven where, the, where they will get DJJS, which is juvenile justice arrest citations, and then they're going to be at an RTC again. Um, and so we obviously support any innovation to bring companies here. And in, you know, it takes private companies and public, you know, and nonprofits. There's a lot of private companies that work with foster kids. And then I'm just going to pinch hit for Leah Case from Boys Town who said that they hope the, the supplemental and enhanced rates mentioned in Section 10, Sub 3, would apply to managed care Medicaid, as well as fee-for-service, as 80% of the state is on managed care plans, including Washoe and Clark counties. So, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Marlene Lockard, and I'm representing SEIU 1107. I cannot tell you how important this bill is. We have had such an ongoing issue for so many years with the lack of appropriate facilities and mental service um, services for our children in the state. Our SEIU members who work with the division, Department of Family Services in Clark County, have been attacked, injured, some very severely, and we have um, a record to show you of what's happened when they are in facilities that are not equipped to properly care for the level and classification of the mentally, um, mental uh, uh, problems that certain children may have. It remains a daily challenge for staff attempting to prov provide care to children in need of higher and appropriate levels of care. This is an incentive for the right reasons for our state to incentivize people to come in to help us with some of these issues and provide beds and facilities. I. Um, can't tell you how strongly we support this measure. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, um, Vice Chair, for stepping in for a sec. We'll go to the phone lines. BPS, do we have anyone on the phone lines to give testimony in support of AB 445? Callers, if you'd like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 445, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers in, in support at this time. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone here in Carson City wishing to give testimony in opposition to Assembly Bill 445? 
With that, we will go to the phone lines. Um, BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines wishing to give testimony in opposition to Assembly Bill 445? If you'd like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 445, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone here in Carson City wishing to give a testimony in the neutral to Assembly Bill 445? With that, BPS, anyone on the phone lines wishing to give testimony in the neutral to Assembly Bill 445? If you'd like to testify in neutral for Assembly Bill 445, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to testify in neutral at this time. Thank you so much. With that, um, would the bill sponsor like to come forward and give some closing remarks? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and committee for hearing this bill, and thank you to everyone who came forward to support it. Uh, I did want to say uh, the comments that were relayed from Ms. Leah Case, I, I was intending for those Medicaid rates to uh, apply to MCO services as well. So I'll be working with uh, LCB to make sure that that is uh, clear in the bill. So thank you again for your time and I will get out of your way. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on AB 445 and take a like 30 second re recess. I will now open the hearing for Assembly Bill 430. Um, I would like to ask Assemblywoman Bacchus and bill presenters to please begin at your when you're ready. Thanks so much, um, Vice Chair Considine and members of Assembly Committee on Revenue. For the record, I'm Shay Bacchus, representing Assembly District 37. It is my honor to be here today to present Assembly Bill 430. I am joined by Lake Martin, Executive Director of Nevada Cannabis Association and Professor of Cannabis Policy at UNLV, as well as Daniel Stewart of Brownstein, Hyatt, Faber, Farber, and Shrek, who are both available to answer any questions. We do also have um, a variety of people in the audience as well who are very knowledgeable, so if we get any difficult questions, we may um, call a few friends. Um, this bill addresses two issues, clarifying taxation of cannabis vaping products and the wholesale excise tax on sales of cannabis and cannabis products. Because there are two distinct issues, I am going to address the vaping tax issue first and then move to the wholesale excise tax. Um, basically, this is found in section one. And before I get there, I just want to make sure the committee, we have a variety of proposed amendments. Um, with this direct presentation, we're going to be working off of um, an amendment that um, I had prepared. It's about um, a paragraph, so submitted by myself, as well as proposed amendment to AB 430 that is proposed by the Nevada Cannabis Association. So starting with section one for AB 430, dealing with the vaping taxation, the tax of vaping and other tobacco t products was meant to make sure that both vaping and traditional smoking were taxed at the same level. There was no intention to include cannabis consumption. On the contrary, both the legislative history and the text show 
showed that the intention was to exclude cannabis. But we want to make sure there is further certainty in the law. Section 1 would make it clear that cannabis vaporizers are not taxed as other nicotine vaping products, even if they may look like nicotine vaping products. Anything related to cannabis should be regulated by the CCB. Only cannabis products will be covered by this section. This means vaping devices that can only be used for cannabis. These devices burn a cannabis extract at a much higher temperature than the vaping devices used for synthesized liquid nicotine liquid. You could, also, you could not use these cannabis vaping devices to vape nicotine products even if you wanted to. The nicotine liquid would be vaporized almost instantly. That said, given the similarities and the appearances between the nicotine and cannabis devices, there has been some concern that this could open the door to vaping products that can be used for both cannabis and tobacco. To the extent these products exist, and I do not know if they do, this law would not cover them. Section 1 is meant to exclude um, cannabis products only. The proposed amendment makes this abundantly clear if there remains any confusion. In sum, Section 1 would add clarity to the law and help preserve the bright line between cannabis and non-cannabis products. Next, we will move on to the wholesale excise tax. The remainder of AB 430 addresses the wholesale excise tax. The wholesale excise tax of 15% is not based on actual sales prices, but on what is called fair market value. The fair market value calculation does not accurately reflect the current market, and as a result, growers are paying taxes on a, a number that is often more than double their actual sell prices. We looked at a number of options for how to address this from getting rid of the tax entirely to trying to figure to trying to fix the fair market value calculation. And I want to acknowledge the significant amount of time that members of the industry spent researching these various solutions. We settled on the solution we are presenting today because it has broad industry support. In this bill presentation, we'll discuss the existing fair market calculation and how this bill would fix what's broken with it using a model that has been in place for years in Colorado. There are two excise taxes in Nevada for cannabis products, a retail excise tax and a wholesale excise tax. The retail excise tax is a tax at the point of sale of 10% of the sales price. This tax applies to adult use products only. It does not apply to medical use. The revenue generated by this tax goes directly to the state education fund. In fiscal year 2022, the amount generated by the retail excise tax was $89 million. The wholesale excise tax is a 15% tax on the fair market value of a transfer of cannabis or cannabis products by a cultivation facility to another cannabis licensee. This is not a sale directly to a, cus a consumer. It is a sell of usually bulk product to either a production licensee who might make, take the, that flower and produce pre-rolls or directly to a retail store, who will then sell it to consumers. The revenue generated by this tax goes to pay the operating budget of the CCB. Then $5 million goes to counties as a payment for costs of local enforcement, and the remainder goes to the state education fund. In fiscal year 2022, the revenue generated by this tax was $63 million. As I mentioned, the wholesale excise tax is not 15% at the sales price when the, that product is transferred from the cultivation facility. The tax is based based on fair market to value, which is a number published twice a year by the Department of Tax based on the median prices of all wholesales for a period of six months starting nine months prior. As this graph shows, the fair market value calculation has remained steadily and significantly above the actual market price of product. Put simply, growers are selling a pound for $1,000 and paying taxes as if they sold it for $2,000. As you can imagine, this is crushing cultivators. 
We've been working with the Department of Tax closely on this to see what changes could be made in regulation and what changes would require a legislative fix. The current statute doesn't provide much guidance to tax on how to calculate fair market value. And they've said to us that they would like more direction from the legislature. And as a side note, we also have, I believe, Director Hughes still here, if she didn't escape us I'm from the Department of Taxation. Turns out we didn't have to look for our, for a solution to fix the fair market value calculation. Colorado is the state with the cannabis excise tax structure most similar to ours, and their modifications, if adopted here, will result in a wholesale excise tax that more accurately and fairly taxes the actual sale price. Here's how. So we're going to go over kind of a couple current issues and solutions. The fair market value applies to all wholesale transfers regardless of the actual sales price. Solution, if the transaction is an arm's length that is at arm's length, meaning the two parties don't share ownership, then the 15% wholesale tax is on the actual sales price. The fair market tax, the fair market value only applies to transactions between vertically integrated companies where the transferee may not be paying the market price because the transfer is between licenses owned by the same company. The next current issue, the fair market value is inflated because it is calculated on sales data that includes the cost of tax. Solution Colorado fixed this by directing that the fair market value be calculated based on the sales prices exclusive of tax. Current issue, the next current issue, slide eight. The length of time used for calculating the fair market value is too long and doesn't keep pace with the actual market price. Solution, the fair market value will be published quarterly. It's fairly simple solution. Where the sale is between unaffiliated companies, tax the actual sales price and make sure that the fair market value when calculated is as accurate as possible. If the vice chair will allow, we will walk through the amendment because it does make some relevant corrections from the original bill draft. So starting with section two, as we discussed section one um, separately from the other proposed amendment, section two should be deleted because we do not intend to add cannabis production facilities to the licensee types that are responsible for the wholesale excise tax. Section three deletes reference to deleted section two. Section four revises the definition of sales price to exclude excise tax. We may need to beef this up a little because I've talked to fiscal and there may be a little misunderstanding but about this, but our intent was to address the issue that we referenced earlier about the wholesale price, including the amount of tax being passed to the consumer, and then the fair market value is calculated on that amount. Also, Section 5 corrects the section to delete cannabis production facility from the list of taxpayers. Again, there was not an intent to create a new tax for production facilities. Section 6 removes um, a deletion. Um, so there would be like no changes to the existing statute. Section seven spells out that if the sale is between affiliated entities, then the fair market value applies. And if it is between unaffiliated entities, then the excise tax of 15% is on the sales price. The amendment deletes subsection three, which added a section on production facilities, which was not the intent. Production facilities have never been responsible for an excise tax. The tax is levied on cultivation facilities only. Subsection four cleans up an issue that tax recently addressed. By adding the language but may be recovered from the purchaser, it makes it clear that the retail excise tax can be broken out on the receipt that the purchaser sees and doesn't need to be baked into the sales price. Subsection 9B defines affiliate. The goal is for this to be clear as possible. Fair market value applies to transactions between vertically integrated licensees. S section 7, subsection 9G clarifies existing practice that the tax is on the first sale or transfer by a cultivation facility to another type of licensee. License. Otherwise, you'd run into the issue where there's a new tax every time the product is transferred along the supply chain. 
Also, this section removes a deletion that shouldn't have been deleted. There have there was a bill passed last session that if you were transferring transferring between two cultivation facilities, that you own the tax is not levied until it is transferred out of the cultivation facility to another establishment. I'd also like to circle back um, when I was talking about the sales tax being um, removed. That was in reference to. Let me see. Oh goodness, subsection four of section seven um, with respect to our clear intent. The intent is not for retail excise tax not to be excluding the um, wholesale tax paid. It's on the retail amount um, when the product is sold. Section eight in the amendment again corrects that there is no new tax for production facilities. Section nine gives additional guidance to the Department of Tax to adopt regulations to calculate the fair market value, essentially according to the Colorado model, which is quarterly, using median of wholesale transactions between unaffiliated parties during that period. Also because the Cannabis Compliance Board contracts with metric to provide seed to sell tracking services to the state, it requires the board ensure that metrics includes a method to denote in that tracking software whether the transaction is between affiliated or unaffiliated parties. That will help Department of Taxation weed out irrelevant data when calculating fair market value. Section 10 is the effective date, which is upon passage and approval for the purposes of adopting any regulations and administrative tasks, and then on January 1st, 2024 for the rollout to the licensees. We are happy to answer any questions, and again, we also have representation from variety industry organizations as well as the Department of Taxation here and CCB. And I hoped I saw Mr. Clumas, and I think he's still here. I, thank you. Um, available to answer questions as well. Thank you for the presentation. Will your presenters just be here to ask to answer questions? Okay. So we do. We can start off with. We have a question from Assembly Member Orrin Licker. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for bringing this bill. It makes eminent sense to use fair market value in a fair way. And um, the one question I have is, obviously, this creates incentives to uh, have disguised affiliates. And have, have there been in problems in Colorado where uh, an entity that's truly in real, functionally an affiliate but is presented as non-affiliated to try to avoid you know, and not, not, and to game the system. Do, how much do we have to worry about the incentive to game the system, the new system? Thank you, Lake Martin, for the record. Um, thank you, Assemblyman Orrentlinker. We spoke with the Colorado Department of Revenue, and what they've done is, and this is the benefit of using a Colorado model, is they have eight years of experience with this exact model that we're seeking to adopt. They have regulations that are in place to even more specifically define who is affiliated and who is unaffiliated. So what we've adopted here is an affiliated model using what's already in our statutes here in Nevada based on gaming, um, and we can further define affiliated and unaffiliated in regulation. Also, tax always has the ability to audit that. The, the licensees will be able to indicate an affiliated transaction when they make the transaction in metric, and taxation will have the ability to go back and audit that if that turns out to be not the case. Thank you. Next question will be from Assemblyman Hafen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and our Vice Chair, sorry, and thank you, Madam Chair, also for uh, bringing, uh, presenting this bill on behalf of the committee. Um, I know during the interim this is something that had come up in conversations and um, has been an issue uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, and I know one of the problems has been DTAX struggles with the, the calculations on how to calculate fair market tax um, because a lot of the businesses have gone vertically integrated and so um, I just want to know, uh, obviously, I, I supported just doing a flat fee uh, per pound, uh, but I clearly lost that in the uh, drafting of this bill. Um, but I just want to know, is, is, is DTAX going to be able to um, now 
calculate uh, the per pound charge uh, on an easier basis. So um, people are being charged, um, I believe Dr. Ornlicker was trying to say fair and equitable, so I'll, I'll use it instead. Thank you. We can ask Department of Tax, Shay Backus, for the record. Shelly Hughes, for the record. Um, so with this Colorado model, we would still have to calculate the fair market value for those uh, affiliated uh, businesses. So in reality, it's going to be doing the same calculations. The only um, ease of burden will be when those unaffiliated businesses have the contract price. So they'll, they'll do the 15% on the contract price. So if I understand you correctly, we're, uh, just a clarification for me, follow up, thanks. Um, if I understand correctly, it, it does solve the portion when the independent sells directly to a dispensary, but it's not necessarily going to fully alleviate the uh, issue that we've had on determining fair market value on the vertically integrated portion. Uh, Shelley Hughes, for the record, uh, yes, we'll be using the same metric data. Um, it will be helpful to have the, um, the the ability to denote who's an affiliate and who's not an affiliate in the metric system. So that will help with our calculations. But essentially, we're still doing the same fair market value calculations. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Thank you. And our next question will be from um, Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Vice Chair. Madam Chair, you know, I, I should say I love a bill that says I think we're reducing taxes, aren't we, the, on the businesses, cannabis business. If that's what I hear some of it. You're changing the tax structure. It'll probably lower the revenue coming to the state, uh, if I understand correctly, for clarification. Thank you, um, Assemblyman um, O'Neill, by and through Vice Chair um, Shay Backus, for the record. Um, you know, I don't want to look at it as just we're obviously um, decreasing revenue per se um, because the revenue from both the wholesale and retail tax does go to the education um, fund. The reality here is we're making sure it's fair. If yeah. um, we, because I don't know what the, what is going to happen with the economy moving forward, but right now there is a problem where the farm, fair market value, as I understand it, is a lot higher than the actual sell price. And so it's to even it out and make sure that people are paying appropriately their 15% tax versus like paying 30% that it could be on certain products that they may sell a lot less than the fair market value. And, and I agree with you. We should be looking at some equitability across the line, but I think there will be, if you look at just the tax numbers and in all honesty, the cannabis tax has really not performed to the level that was originally presented to this, to this body several years ago, uh, back in 2015, I think. Um, as I recall, at least. But so one of the other, if I may ask a second, it's somewhat of a follow-up, Vice Chair. One of the issues I do know, though, that is with the wholesalers right now is they have to pay their state tax within 30 days of sale, but they have not always received their payment within 30 days. Um, so I guess I'm asking, could we address that too? It's stretching out to 90 days or somehow uh, uh, adjusting that in their form too? Thank you, Assemblyman O'Neill, through Vice Chair Shea Backus for the record. And I agree with you. We don't really have it in our provision right now, but that is something that I am open to looking at. But I don't want to put D Director Hughes on the spot. But if she could elaborate, if there was, if there's any problems to extending that deadline, that'd be greatly appreciated. Shelley Hughes, for the record. So moving to a quarterly tax um, does become uh, more difficult for us, especially with our cash counts, um, the size of 
the uh, tax payment is uh, significantly greater. Um, it also ha has uh, some difficulty with auditing. Um, also, many of our tax types are monthly. We have very few that are quarterly. Um, so with the sales tax, for you to be able to report quarterly, you have to be making less than 10000 a month. So most of these businesses, their tax payment is uh, greater than 10000 So it, it becomes difficult for us to move to a, a quarterly tax return. Thank you for that. Uh, let me think about it. <laughs> I'll get back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you for this. My question was actually um, similar to that in, in Section 9 where it talked about the quarterly, but my question was just um, when it has the seeds to sale tracking, I assume that we already have this here, so this would just update it so that it's all tracked correctly? Thank you, Lake Martin, for the record. Yes, we already use a seed to seal tracking system called Metric, um, and I believe they we've talked to them about this, and they are able to add the functionality in the software so that you can designate whether it's an affiliated or unaffiliated transaction at the time of sale. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Assemblyman Gray. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I'm going to go off the reservation here a little bit. I have never understood this from day one, why this system had to be so darn complicated. I really thought maybe somebody was, excuse the pun, high when they came up with this, this whole taxation system. But I'm just wondering why we don't streamline it and make it more like any other product that's sold. Just tax it at the end and send it off and make it easier on everybody. There's still too many opportunities for miscalculations for everything else. I mean, if, you know, the, the product changes daily, you know, the tax is going to change daily, you know, based on supply and demand and, you know, based on the actual type of product who's made, you know, whether it's a good product or a bad product, just a, you know, maybe a, some kind of a, an additional sales tax. It just seems so cumbersome and so inefficient and so costly to, to do it the way we're doing it. I, I just, I, I don't know why we can't get there and maybe if somebody could answer that. Thank you, Lake Martin, for the record. The issue is sticker shock at the point of sale. So if you, if you move all of the taxes to the point of sale, then you have consumers who are seeing a 25%, 30% in Washington, 37% tax on their receipt when they're at the store. Our largest competition being the unlicensed illicit market, which doesn't have tax obligations, doesn't have costs of compliance, doesn't have costs of testing. They can sell for much, much cheaper. And so, and that's a very real, very real source of competition. And so that's the issue with having such a large tax percentage at the point of sale. Yeah, and I would counter that they're paying that anyway, regardless. I mean, it's, it's being passed down to them. Maybe we look, maybe we need to look at enforcement issues. You know, I mean, somehow we got there with alcohol. I mean, we're not, we don't really see a huge illicit alcohol market anymore. I mean, yes, this is easier to grow, but, you know, maybe it's a, an enforcement issue that we need to focus on. Lake Martin, for the record, and we would like to tackle that as well. Absolutely. Um, thank you for the question, Assemblyman. Um, Shay Backus, for the record. I just want to add, um, with the liquor sales, we do have, and I could even turn to fiscal, but I do believe there's different points um, where there is taxation as well. Thank you. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, and thank you for bringing forward this, because I know that I've had a chance to talk with many of the growers as well. Learned a lot about flour one day. So anyway, moving on. Um, my question kind of has to do with, I just want to make sure I'm understanding both the language on page 9 and then also some of the crossed out language from page 7, where it has to do with the, um, uh, let, me, let me clarify this, this has to do with section 9.2, uh, when it has to do with the, the denotation of transfers of cannabis between affiliates. And so I just want to make sure that I'm understanding that these affiliates, based upon the language that's been crossed off on page 7, that they, are, they do not have the identical ownership, or do they have the same ownership, but it might be in different locations? If you could clarify that for me. 
Sure. Thank you, Lake Martin, for the record. Yeah, for affiliate, we adopted the definition in gaming um, and happy to further refine it if it needs refining. But really what we're looking at is if I sell to you, it's an arm's length transaction. We're not affiliated. We don't have common ownership. Um, if I sell to another licensee that I either have identical ownership or nearly identical ownership, vertically integrated company are, is a term that we use in the cannabis industry, which almost, almost always means identical ownership. But just we wanted to be clear that in case it wasn't always identical ownership, we are meanting, meaning to apply the fair market value to vertically integrated companies only and others where you have an independent cultivator selling to uh, someone that they're not affiliated with, then that is based on the actual sales price. That needs a flow chart, but that makes total sense. So thank you so much for that clarification. Okay, thank you. So uh, I have a, a question. Um, there is also um, another proposed amendment here from the Nevada Cannabis Association. Um, are you in support or where are we on, on that? Thank you, Vice Chair. The, the amendment from the Nevada Cannabis Association we are in support of. Um, and again, <laughs> The Nevada Cannabis Association represents the majority of cannabis licensees in Nevada, um, and we do have broad support for the amendment that we have proposed. Now, I believe that you are also hearing another amendment from um, another group, Sierra Cannabis Coalition, um, and we are not in support. That's not a friendly amendment. Um, what we've done is taken a system that is broken and sought, seek, sought to fix it, right, by fixing the calculation. And, and that's really the issue. We don't think that the best fix is to move a tax to the consumer for the issues that we discuss. Um, so we don't think that the wholesale excise tax should be moved to be solely customer facing. What we want to do is address the current issue, which is fixing the calculation. So where you have an arm's length transaction, you're taxing on the actual sales price. That's what we should be doing. That's what Colorado has been doing for eight years. And that's why their system works a little bit better than ours in more accurately reflecting the sales prices on the market. Thank you very much, and thank you for answering the question I meant to ask. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, we will thank you for the presentation. Uh, we will move to those in support of Assembly Bill 430. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the committee, vice chair, uh, Daniel Stewart, uh, representing Puffco, uh, for the record. And part of the reason why I wanted to speak, I'm, I'm just speaking in support of section one of the bill. This is on the vape issue. Uh, it's because I've had numerous conversations in good faith with both the department of taxation and some of the health districts. And I want to make sure, uh, we get crystal clear the, in, the intent, uh, especially with the amendment that's been presented. Um, so I brought with me a little show and tell. I'll be quick. Um, I would have thought this was one of those fancy pens that the governor's u governor uses to sign a bill until a week ago. And it was explained to me that this is actually a cannabis vaporizer. And, and the reason I bring this up is because technologically, even though it may look, I'm not a big connoisseur or know what, of, of vape pens, even though it might look like it, uh, to break it down into its individual components, the technology is completely different. You have to, the liquid itself, it, there's no place to put cartridges. You, you basically stuff a cannabis wax into this, and it heats up at a super high temperature, uh, and, then, and, and then it vapes. So um, we're not talking about just a legal distinction, like that we're just creating something that somehow there's exactly the same devices. One's used for nicotine, and it's taxed at one rate. One's used for cannabis. They're actually completely different devices, and we tried to make sure that's clear in the amendment. Uh, lastly, going to um, uh, the assemblyman from Carson City's uh, comments about potential uh, uh, tax, tax revenue. Um, my understanding, this is a very small subgroup, um, and my understanding is the vast majority of these folks that make these are currently not paying the vape, vape tax because as they understand it, they don't believe that the law currently reaches them. They think that it was meant to tax tobacco. They look at the, the various exemptions. And so they haven't been paying it, but they they do realize that there's room in the law that, uh, that it could be interpreted otherwise. So they're just seeking clarity. So I don't know that there'd be any 
lost tax revenue on this one at all. It would just be a, uh, a recognition of what I think has already happened in reality. And that is it. I urge support of the bill. Thank you. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Jim Wadhams. I'm here today on behalf of the law firm of Black and Wadhams. Uh, there is a letter in the record signed by Paul Larson of Black and Wadhams, so I'm not going to go any further in, in support other than just to say uh, on behalf of the firm, uh, we're expressing support for the bill and, and the amendments by the Cannabis Association. Thank you. Good evening, Vice Chair Considine and members of the Assembly Committee on Revenue. My name is Brandon Wygand, spelled W-I-E-G-A-N-D. I'm the President of the Nevada Cannabis Association and Chief Operating Officer of Thrive Cannabis Marketplace. I've been a part of the cannabis industry since 2015 and was involved in the process in 2017 that initially established the Wholesale Marijuana Tax, or WNT. A tax the industry agreed to in an effort to provide a funding mechanism for our regulator, at the time Department of Taxation and now the Cannabis Compliance Board. The intent of this tax was to establish a true fair market value price specifically for cultivation products and apply a 15% tax exclusively on the initial transfer of those products. In practice, implementation of WNT policy has missed the mark. The current calculation of fair market value is flawed. The market prices utilized are inclusive of tax, and those prices are being used without correction to calculate FMB, resulting in a tax on top of the tax. Additionally, the fair market value is not eliminating non-arms link transactions from the calculation. Many vertically integrated operators inflate the value of their vertically integrated cultivation transfers in an effort to mitigate the effects of federal 280E tax. This has resulted in a fair market value calculation that is disconnected with the reality of the industry. Assembly Bill 430, with the amendments proposed by the Nevada Cannabis Association, gets us back on track with a tax structure and practice that supports the original intent of the policy. The WNT is charged on the actual contract price of all arm's length transactions. A fair market value is determined based on the amalgamation of those contract prices, exclusive of taxes, and can only be applied to non-arm's length transactions between entities under common control. AB 430 clarifies and reiterates that the WMT is only applied to the initial transfer of product from cultivation licensees and stipulates that no additional taxes are applied on subsequent transfers or conversions. Updating the frequency of the FMV calculation from semi-annually to quarterly ensures calculations are closely aligned with market prices. AB 430 and the proposed NCA amendments have broad support amongst the industry in addition to the support of DOT and CO, uh, CCB. Thrive was initially supportive of the efforts to eliminate WMT in its entirety. However, we are now strongly opposed to those proposed amendments for the following reasons. Eliminating the WNT would increase the retail excise tax to 15%, resulting in a 22 to 24% tax at the register when including sales tax. Rather than fixing the fundamental flaws discussed in the WMT calculation, this proposal locks in those flaws and shifts the tax burden to consumers. Eliminating WNT passes a business tax onto our consumers. High taxes on cannabis are already the number one complaint we get from our customers. Increasing the retail tax further will only make it more difficult for licensees to compete with the unlicensed market. On behalf of the NCA and Thrive, we support AB 430 as these reforms will correct the inherent flaws in the current WMT policy, providing much needed support and relief to the license industry. Thank you. Well, I was going to say good afternoon, but it's now good evening. <laughs> Hopefully I can get everybody's attention a little bit. It's an honor to be here. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. My name is Salpi Boyajan, uh, spelled B-O-Y-A-J-I-A-N. I'm the president of Canon Nevada, previously known and operated as Flower One. Canon Nevada is currently the largest cultivator here in the state of Nevada. We are also the largest cannabis taxpayer here in the state. I actually moved to Vegas in 2015 and was one of the original license winners from the first round when we just started with the medical times. Um, I actually started this business with the support of my family and I chose to move my life to Nevada because I believed in the way the cannabis industry was being fully rolled out through the regulatory space and I wanted to truly help set the golden standard here. And I know we've said that word quite a bit, but I truly try to believe in that because this is what is one of the big pieces of the puzzle, I would say, that we've been constantly trying to figure out over the last eight years. What does that actually mean here for us in cannabis, right? So I wanted to make something clear. So the company, formerly known as Flower One, just went through a very brutal bankruptcy slash, it's called a Canadian restructuring known as a CCAA. A lot of people lost a lot of money through this, and a lot of people lost their life savings through investing in that company. The company has paid approximately $30 million in wholesale marijuana tax just since 2019. That represented 24% of our revenue. 
If the intent was to truly charge us 15% of our wholesale sales, that would have equated to about $18 million of taxes collected, meaning we technically overpaid by over $11 million. This amount would have been able to potentially save the company and prevent all of these people, including myself, from losing a very large amount of money. We do not believe the current tax structure is sustainable and are pleading with you to take immediate action to help save the industry and give us a fighting chance in today's climate, post-COVID era and all. My team and I wholeheartedly believe in this plant and I think there's no better place than here in Nevada to operate in. We are asking to please consider all the learnings of the last eight years alongside the changes occurring in the cannabis industry nationwide to help make this state truly the golden standard of regulated cannabis. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Brett Scaleri for the record here on behalf of CPCM Holdings, DBA Thrive Marketplace, Green Mart of Nevada, Cura Cannabis Solutions, DBA Cura Leaf, Clark Natural Meta Medicinal Solutions, and also Nevada Organic Remedies, DBA The Source. Will not belabor the points. Um, support AB 430 wholeheartedly with the amendment presented by Madam Chair and the Nevada Cannabis Association, and would urge your support. This bill really um, is an issue of fairness and gives the operators some clarity moving forward on the wholesale tax, and it would be much appreciated in a time when the industry is is struggling. So we appreciate your support, and I can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in support in Carson? If not, BPS, is there anyone on the phones who would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 430? Callers, if you'd like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 430, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Akal, and I am the general manager of Zenway Corp. I have submitted written testimonies to this committee and um, will briefly summarize our support of this important legislation. Um, Zenway Corp is a Nevada State licensed indoor cannabis cultivation facility located in North Las Vegas. We are an independent company not affiliated with any other entity and employ approximately full-time employees. As a legally licensed cultivation facility, we are responsible for paying a 15% cannabis excise tax. The tax itself and the tax calculation is excessive and leads to unintended business and operational consequences. Due to the way the tax is calculated, we pay an effective tax rate of 25 to 30%. In some instances, this single tax is as high as 60% of our sales price. This high effective tax rate has come at the same time as a significant drop in the wholesale price of cannabis. Last year, we saw a drop of 50% in some categories. With effective tax rates as high as this, it has not been possible to meet all of our business obligations. To this point, we are currently paying back whole cannabis taxes under a tax installment plan, which includes high penalties and interest. Also, we have had to defer payment on other obligations and incurred fees and or interest payments on those obligations. For these reasons, Zenway Corp supports AB 430. Under this legislation, we pay a 15% tax on all our sales, which is based upon our actual sales price. And all our sales are still reported on the state mandated seat sale tracking system, which must also be accepted by our customers. I'm happy to answer any additional questions this committee may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. BPS, is there anyone else on the line? Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you. Um, we will now move to opposition for uh, against Assembly Bill 430. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to testify in opposition? <clears throat> 
Thank you, Assembly Committee on Revenue, uh, and I apologize for the late hour. I will be as brief as possible. My name is Will Adler, and I am representing the Sierra Cannabis Coalition today. Uh, Sierra Cannabis Coalition is a, 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 can, a coalition of cannabis license holders who have spent about the last 18 months actually reviewing the fair market value here in Nevada and came up with a few assessments based upon that. Uh, the fair market value uh, is a product of the, the actual retail ballot initiative back in 2016. We passed this uh, wholesale tax upon that, and, and we had to keep that for three years inclusively. Uh, but uh, after, after passing that in 2016, uh, SEC found in our uh, intense uh, uh, review of the data that uh, the vertically integrated sales were not only included in the data, but maybe the majority of the data used to calculate fair market value instead of using only arm's length transactions, as mentioned by uh, Brandon there. Uh, included in that was that uh, the, the impacts of these, these uh, vertical sales was the inflation of the fair market value. So identifying a few core things that we found wrong with it was the, the questionable data management to use metric data to then send it to taxation blindly, uh, the addition of uh, errors in the data set, including $10,000 uh, data points for the fair market value calculation, and uh, the implication of that is a, a broken fair market value system. System. So, uh, Sierra Camps Coalition wants to clarify we are here in support of AB 430, uh, but we do think there is a better way to do it. Uh, to be clear, we'll be presenting this amendment to you uh, shortly. Uh, the cannabis. Uh, <clears throat> the cannabis products really get, get, get rough when you look at a cultivation and how they have to operate today. Cultivations who are third party have no means to sales themselves and have to eat the entirety of the wholesale tax upon receiving it. They must pay that tax within 30 days and have no uh, recourse to mandate payment of themselves within 30 days. Um, as such, this has created an imbalance where the, the wholesale tax uh, is, is owed sometimes 90 or 120 days before for the person who has to pay the wholesale tax, the cultivator actually receives uh, revenue for the products they have given to a dispensary. To correct this, uh, the Sierra Cannabis Coalition is going to go through an amendment here today. Uh, the amendment is to simplify Nevada's tax code. We think there's a simpler and better way to do it and to, to reference every other state I can. No other state does a wholesale tax on cannabis and has a wholesale tax on the growers of cannabis other than Colorado and Nevada today. Every other state has implemented a wholesale tax, has removed that wholesale tax due to the burdens it puts specifically on the cultivator versus the entire rest of the industry. They've identified, especially in California, that this individual tax on the wholesaler would be the detriment and the ending of all third-party businesses. For reference, California had $160 per pound wholesale tax. Nevada today calculates ours as a fair market value based upon a $1,900 pound. That comes out to about a $300 pound per, per pound of cannabis in Nevada. So essentially, California had $160 per pound wholesale tax that they thought would be so burdensome it would eliminate all their third party growers. Nevada has doubled that today in our, our fair market value. Uh, AB 430, with the amendment done by the Nevada Cannabis Association, would rectify some of these concerns when it comes to the actual value of the, the goods sold, but it wouldn't actually rectify the concerns when it comes to the cultivator on receiving payment and owing those taxes before they know they have the money to pay it. Today, most cultivators actually have to pay out of their own bank accounts their wholesale tax prior to receiving any funds from the dispensaries because liens of, on, on, on lead times on, on repayment have gone from 15 days on average when we were a cash business, exchanging cash to cash, to past 60 days on average for the new digital cannabis economy where we transfer goods and receive payments through bank accounts. It is a fact of the market that the current fair market value is structured as such that the, the third party cultivator will be un, unduly burdened by it. Uh, to go to the amendment uh, here, you load that thing? Uh, the Sierra Cannabis Coalition did provide an amendment to AB 430. And again, I, I do want to emphasize we, we are going for simplicity and efficiency and equality under the tax code. To do this, uh, we, we heard about the multitude of issues with fair market value, its calculations, and its quantifications. The simplest way to go forward and the correct way to go forward, as every other state has done across the nation, other than Colorado, is the elimination of the wholesale tax. California did this last year, as I stated, because it saw great detriment to its independent cultivator market. 
to, to achieve this, uh, the Sierra Cannabis Coalition took AB 430, uh, and uh, just briefly going through our amendment, we maintained all of Section 1 of the bill, as Section 1 of the bill is entirely its own issue, and is an issue that is, is, is worthy of its own note. There is a, a need to identify cannabis versus multiple-use products that could be used for cannabis and tobacco, so that portion of the bill is uh, intact and supported. But uh, to, to go further, Section 2, 3, 5, 6, and 9 of the bill will be eliminated in the amendment by the Sierra Cannabis Coalition. This is because we don't see any need to calculate a fair market value anymore. The data has shown that it is impossible to keep this number at a square fair number when you're tracking it over time and releasing it either every six months or every quarter. Just the nature of data being lagging, you will always have an inaccuracy here. So to efficiently uh, level off the tax playing field, uh, I'd like to uh, send the committee to section seven of if the bill. We could, because we're already over yeah. almost six minutes. If, oh. And thank you for this. But if you can, okay. okay. Just so section the highlights, se please. Uh, okay. So section seven of the bill is the bulk of the bill. Uh, Sierra Cannabis Coalition is proposing we do as other states have done and put all the taxes at the retail end. Currently, the cultivators have no means to express their, their, their inability to get paid, but today, Nevada can retain the, the bulk of our, our uh, revenues from the current cannabis wholesale tax. Both the retail tax and the current wholesale tax go into a single stream of revenue by simply changing our 10% retail tax today to a 15% excise tax. That excise tax will be applied to both cultivated products and production products, and the revenues from that would be sufficient to make up the bulk of any loss from the loss of the current wholesale tax. I would say that uh, I, I am not an expert, but I did mock up a few uh, slides for the committee. I don't know if they would be beneficial to go through this at this time, but uh, the, the general gist of it is the, the loss of revenue from the current wholesale tax being leveled off to be fixed as done in the Nevada Cannabis Association model would be significant. Uh, additionally, uh, just to summarize it, the, the revenues retained by having a 15% at retail excise tax would be the same or slightly higher in this model than those seen by the fixed uh, wholesale tax by the NCA's amendment. We can state that pretty factually today because the, the in-depth study we did involved taking all of metric data provided to the Department of Taxation. We calculated what that was, and then we took membership data and all the available data from other folks' metric data to line it up with that. Uh, to calculate that, we, we were able to indicate what was higher than or lower than 15% of fair market value. The average for uh, the Sierra Camps Coalition's data sets was 24% taxes paid over the last calendar year. So that isn't 15% at wholesale, that's 24%. So to show the difference what maybe a truing of the fair market value would be, we indicated what 15% uh, retail would be on what 15% fixed uh, fair market value would be. Uh, I would ask that LCB Fiscal could mock up these uh, data points more successfully than I could, but I'm just trying to indicate that both models will so show some loss of revenue, but both will be retaining significant revenues, and I think the, the, the vast benefit is to the state and to the industry to flatten this out, simplify it, make it easier for people to do business as cannabis businesses, because today the impact of the fair market value is multitude, and it, it, the risk of keeping it far outweighs the benefits of simplifying it and flattening it out at a 15% at retail. Uh, I know uh, 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 Associate Maya is coming to speak to some of her own personal concerns and uh, their own opinions for why the fair market value should be changed, but changed in a way that eliminates it and makes it equal for everyone. And uh, hopefully you all can uh, see that here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the presentation in, in opposition of this bill. But I know when we talked earlier today, I just want to bring up something that, that when we had talked earlier and you explained this to me without this chart, not having this chart. So I think there'll probably be a lot of follow up after this is as you were explaining it, um, it was going from the 15% on the cultivator side, the 15% or the 10 per 15% 10 percent on the re, um, retail side, that it was totaling 15%, um, which in, in my mind, without doing all of this math, is a loss, um, especially for the, the education fund. So just looking at a slide that we had earlier in the original presentation, um, there it, it listed how much the F, um, FYI, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, F year 2022 for both the wholesale and the retail 
um, and the total of that, and then moving that over for the next year. If it's 89 million in wholesale um, and 44.5, adding these together, the difference, the difference being significant, potentially, and this is something we could probably follow up on. I don't want to take up everybody's time, but it would be a loss of nearly $20 million. So we probably want to look at, at these sets of numbers if you're showing something different, but I just wanted to kind of bring up what we had spoken about earlier and that moving it but cutting it, not sure if that works. Yes. I do have a couple of other questions. I, to be clear, yes, I, I, I do think both models, both the truing of or making the fair market value a true 15% charged only 15% as the, the Nevada Cannabis Association has presented, will create a loss of revenue today. We've heard from Flower One that their average taxes was 24% last year. That that lines up with the average that our Sierra Cannabis Coalition uh, members did pay as well over the last couple of years. So just stating that, knowing that the 15% is currently inflated, we will see losses from from flattening that, but we will also see losses from of revenue if we make it a 15% at retail. But I would say the losses are within the same ballpark or about the same uh, as I could model it. But again, I'm not LCB fiscal, and I think uh, it would behoove us to have a mock-up of both uh, amendments to, to really judge them against each other properly. And I'll answer any other questions. Thank, Thank you. you. We do have a question from Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Vice Chair. I wasn't able to get the questioning, so I appreciate it. I wanted to ask the other um, cannabis association, but how would you address the 30-day payment issue with from wholesaler to taxation? Do you have any suggestions? And I'll get with them offline. So I, I'd appreciate any thoughts on that matter. And thank you, Vice Chair, for allowing me this question. Uh, thank you, uh, Assemblyman uh, O'Neill. Uh, to be clear, uh, in the Sierra Cannabis Coalition model, there would no longer be a wholesale tax payment to be made by the cultivator. The, the cultivator would no longer have the wholesale tax at all. As uh, in, in, our, in our amendment, we would remove the wholesale tax outright, and there would simply be an additional 5% added to the current retail tax. That retail tax is already collected and already registered at everyone's register today. So. There, there simply would not be a wholesale tax for the, the wholesaler to pay within 30 days as we'd be removing it outright. This would, this would simplify the tax code extremely because they, they, they no longer would have to wait or rely on payments to make their tax payments as the, the taxes would be brought to the, the retail front end. Next question, Assemblyman Hafen. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and, and I appreciate you guys being here today. As, as you heard me say earlier, I, I lost the drafting argument over a flat tax. Um, but I do appreciate you guys proposing an amendment today. Um, so I'm going to kind of ask the same question I asked earlier, and that is, is, is had DTAX had an opportunity to um, evaluate um, your proposed amendment to um, see if there'd be a, a reduction in workload to offset um, some of the projected losses that the vice chair say, uh, stated in a slightly different question, not exactly the same, but on the same topic. Sorry, DTAX. Shelly Hughes, for the record. Um, if we moved strictly to a retail marijuana tax, then yes, there would be a, a reduction in workload. Um, we probably would have to um, have additional auditors to audit to make sure that that 15% is being um, imposed, but it, it's minimal um, compared to having the auditors that have to audit the uh, wholesale marijuana tax. So there would be a reduction, but it wouldn't be a 100% reduction um, in the, that audit staff currently. And I'm not going to hold you to this number, and maybe you could follow up with us, but do you have a ballpark figure of, of what that budgetary number looks like? Uh, Shelly Hughes, for the record, I do not at this okay. time. Yeah, but... if you could follow up, I'd just be <laughs> okay. curious. Thank, thank you, and thank you, Vice Chair. I do appreciate the time. Thank you. Uh, Assemblyman Wynn? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I just wanted to... 
um, add on to this. This is a lot of information that we got in a short period of time. So I'm just trying to digest everything. But I was trying to do my research in terms of all the groups that are in play right here. I, I am very, fam very familiar with the Nevada Cannabis Association. But Mr. Adler, I am not familiar with the Sierra Cannabis Coalition. Can you tell me who they are? And, and maybe because I'm a southerner, I don't know, maybe Sierra means something to do with up north. But if you could give me an idea of who they are, because I, I try to find it online, and maybe my, my search is bad, but I cannot come up with anything that indicate a group called Sierra Cannabis Coalition. Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblyman. Uh, Will Adler, for the record. Uh, the Sierra Cannabis Coalition is a coalition formed, uh, well, reformed in the last year. It was uh, addressing the inequities in the cannabis market and sort of the economic pains in the cannabis market. I was asked to come back on board and be the, uh, the point person and the director of the Sierra Cannabis Coalition by four different dispensary groups and then a, a good assortment of cultivations at this point. But the, the, the main focus of it was to try and see why Nevada has struggling economic, uh, you know, lagging indicators compared to other states and our, 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 you know, parallels with our cannabis market. What we found was the uh, Nevada te uh, lab testing program is about 300% more expensive than any other state. The uh, overregulation of the CCB, the fines, fees, and the time and effort bills were unheard of and unseen in any other state. We from Nevada was actually probably the worst tax structure of any state anywhere. The fair market value was incorrectly calculated and 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 everything else we've heard today. But the, the point of the coalition is to address the economic concerns of the industry. And we were put forward to uh, you know address them in a very direct way. But our members tend to like to be more anonymous than, than not. So we don't tend to post them or list them because we've seen direct reprisal from the CCB for members speaking out or trying to address some of these issues in uh, the hearings in the interim. So that's why we don't uh, list them more publicly. Sorry for that. OK. Yeah, I would like to know who they are in terms of that because we want to make sure that folks who are up here, you know, are part of the conversation and they should be open to conversation and not hiding behind the word anonymous because this is important to our state and we want to make sure that all the players are affected should be Nevada based and part of the Nevada conversation. I'm, I'm assuming they're not part of the Cannabis Association. No, some of the members do have membership in both the Cannabis Association, uh, Will Adler for the record. Uh, members of the Sierra Cannabis Coalition do have membership in the Sierra Cannabis Coalition as well as the uh, Cannabis Chamber of Commerce and, and other varieties of, of memberships. But these were folks who, who contacted me and addressed me directly to take on these tougher issues uh, in this way. Great. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, will could, I will come by personally and share a list with you. Well, and you, I, can, you can share with the committee. That would be awesome. Definitely. Great. Thanks, Mr. Adler. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. And the final question from Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, for, for opening up discussions. Um, so my question has to do with uh, page four of um, the information that was handed in. I believe it's, um, it's strikeout language. And it has to do with uh, the decision to strike out the Cannabis Compliance Board um, under uh, well, it would be five and six under the original language where it's the following language is being struck out. The revenues collected from the excise tax imp imposed must be attributed, A, to the Cannabis Compliance Board and to the local governments in an amount determined to be necessary by the board to pay the cost of the board and local governments in carrying out the provisions of chapter da da da. And then it's again mentioned as well. So I'm just wondering, based upon both uh, comments made during the presentation, as well as other comments about the difficulty in, in compliance. Um, many times we know that there's only a few individuals that are making sure that people are under compliance, and the largest hit from everything that I've been able to gather to the industry has to do with the people that are not regulated. They are doing it on their own. They're letting things fall off of a truck. So, what is the decision to cross out or take out? the Cannabis Compliance Board, as well as the local governments, and trying to make sure that this is regulated correctly. 
Thank you for that question. Uh, Will Adler, for the record, with the Sierra Cannabis Coalition. Uh, the, the intent of that was mostly to strike out the entirety of the wholesale tax. The $5 million that is redistributed amongst local governments today uh, was done so at the time for the impacts the illicit market would have, or the legal market would actually have on other counties as counties who do not have cannabis businesses at the time would see no income from cannabis. They did distribute $5 million amongst those counties. Uh, the intent of this amendment was not to strike out that $5 million or to redistribute it uh, more directly into education account, but there are conversations today of what is that $5 million being used for? What are, what are the impacts of legalizing cannabis or what are the impacts of cannabis in Nevada? And it has actually turned out those impacts seem to be more of a black market impact. We, when we legalized cannabis, we actually legalized the easy ability to sell at least an ounce of it at a time to other people. And that, that has actually become the more pressing impact is the, the furthering of the black market and all that. I, I wouldn't speak to uh, taking that $5 million away. And I would actually ask that if we are to take this amendment forward, which I do wish to do so, we would actually add in language like that that takes that $5 million and puts it into this side of the revenue collected. Uh, but at the time, we did have only one stream of revenue, that, that wholesale revenue, and that's where that $5 million came from. But it would be my intent to make that whole or maybe add uh, some language around that $5 million for the future because we, we are seeing that, that need modify as well. Thank you. Thank you, and, and thank you for um, submitting an amendment and doing the self-presentation. If we can move on next for the next opposition. To Assembly Bill 430. Good evening, Assembly Committee on Revenue. My name is Mina Mafua. I'm the CEO of the Real McCoy, a locally owned and operated cannabis cultivation and production facility in Carson City. I've been in my position as CEO since 2020 when our company received its final inspection after our 2018 open application rounds provided by the Nevada Department of Taxation. The Real McCoy was opened and operational in September 2020 after the founders of our company, using their expertise in construction industry, built our facility from the ground up. Our company came to fruition because our cultivators saved the life of our majority owner's spouse using cannabis. In a year, they were able to get her off of life-threatening dosages of opioids that were killing her steadily. We believe our purpose is to educate and provide quality cannabis as an alternative to pharmaceuticals. This company is a labor of love and healing. We've never wished to do anything other than grow the finest products possible and sell them into Nevada's market and have successfully done that until recently when Nevada's fair market value calculation of cultivated cannabis products seem to have shifted towards punishing growers without the means to dispense through a vertically integrated business model. To put a finer point on it, the state has set a fair market value of roughly $2,000 per pound that all cannabis cultivators pay wholesale tax on. Since July 2022, the average tax rate has been $320 per pound, meaning the real McCoy is not paying a tax rate of 15%, but actually 24%. As such, we find ourselves at a loss for how to continue operating when the rules we're playing by aren't applied fairly. When we understand the difficulties that cannabis retail stores face, but it's a matter of fact, many products we've sold to dispensaries get resold to consumers before we get paid for those products. This leaves us the sole payers of the wholesale tax required to pay the tax to pay this tax out of our revenue as we await payment on previously sold goods. In no other industry is there a wholesale tax. The producer of the product is usually the one absorbing the cost of that good, and the same can be seen in the cannabis industry. AP 430 gives us the opportunity to correct the oversight of the 2016 ballot initiative. At the time, voters wanted assurances cannabis taxes would go to education, as the wholesale and retail tax both ultimately wind up with the education fund today. It is in the interest of the cannabis industry as a whole and the state of Nevada to do as California did last year and remove the wholesale tax to save the independent. Sorry, we're going on four minutes, and I believe this is the letter that you submitted. So, if you wouldn't mind just oh, yep. it up, thank you. Uh, to save the independent cultivators. As an operator of the highly efficient and streamlined cannabis business that may be the smallest in the state, we've tried to do everything right and never had a violation with the Cannabis Compliance Board. 
Nevada doesn't need to add more rules and complexity in calculating a fair market value for cannabis. Nevada needs to simplify its tax code and remove the wholesale tax altogether. Thank you for your consideration in this matter, and I hope that you save the small business cultivators out there. Thanks. Is there anyone else in Carson City in opposition of a bill, a Assembly Bill 430? If not, BPS, is there anyone on the phones who would like to testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 430? Callers, if you'd like to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 430, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Um, we will now move to anyone who is neutral. Is there anyone in Carson City who would like to testify in neutral on AB 430? Thank you, Madam Chair. John Osaguer, for the record, with Strategies 360, um, representing Metric. You've heard about Metric here a couple times tonight. Um, specifically, we're neutral just because I want to tell you a little bit about uh, in section nine, sub two, it says the board shall ensure that any computer software used t for the seed to sale tracking of cannabis and cannabis products adopted by the board includes a method to denote, denote transfers of cannabis or cannabis products between affiliates. We had some discussion about affiliates and non-affiliates. Metric can track both of those. Um, and so we just wanted to clarify that so that you knew that for the record. And we are neutral. Thank you. Good evening, Vice Chair and members of the committee. Ashley Cruz with Career Nevada for the record here on behalf of the Chamber of Cannabis. The Chamber of Cannabis is Nevada's largest and most diverse 501c6 business trade organization comprised of 62 businesses and 400 business professionals. The Chamber of Cannabis is in neutral of AB 430. Thank you so much. Thank you. BPS, is there anyone on the phone line who would like to testify in neutral? <coughs> If you'd like to testify in neutral for Assembly Bill 430, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 020, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Carl. Oh, thank you. Uh, hello, this is uh, Dr. James McRae, M-A-C-R-A-E. I am a resident of Washington. Thank you for making testimony available remotely by phone. Um, I'm the individual that was contracted by the um, PR Cannabis Coalition to look into the FMV calculations that were being done uh, last year. Um, and my background is in Washington State, where we've been legal for uh, almost 10 years now. Um, I made a business effectively using c sale traceability data and doing analytic assessments on it and various things. And earlier, um, did some work in Nevada, which revealed uh, some oddities in laboratory data, which was acted on very quickly. However, with respect to the fair market value calculations, um, I was charged with looking into that last year, and I, I researched it. And some of the testimony today confuses me because I thought that uh, Nevada's system was effectively based on Colorado's system. And so when I read some of the documents historically where the system was set up, I, when I had the metric data dump from Nevada, to look at, I got very confused because what I was seeing in the data and the calculations that I saw on it simply didn't add up to the numbers that were being reported out of the state. So anyway, it's cut to, cut to the chase, and I can certainly give you details if you have any questions on both the work I did on the FMV and some of the stuff that uh, Will Adler talked about earlier about some of the projections going forward. I did much of that work as well. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, you know, feel free. I would want to caution you on a couple of things. Um, in the wholesale space with taxation, Washington State, where I reside, 
started off as a 25-25-25 excise tax, where the first step of wholesale, the production, uh, was assessed 25%. The next step of, of production processing, uh, where stuff is packaged and made into edibles and infused products and things, was also taxed at 25%. And then at retail, the consumer was effectively taxed another 25% retail, all of this being on top of state sales taxes, et cetera. That was changed fairly quickly in our market for a very good reason that Californians subsequently learned and others did as well, uh, to a 0, 0, 0,037%. And Washington State now enjoys the highest, I believe, retail excise sales to excise tax on cannabis in the country. Um, and we generate 530-odd million direct in uh, excise taxes at the point of retail. You know, retail. Some of the comments today confused me about throwing taxes on consumers. I mean, if you've got taxes hidden at the wholesale supply chain, you know, with FMD or however you choose to calculate them, those ultimately come through into prices consumers. They may not see it as a line item as tax, but they're going to be paying, paying it. I will assure you of two things. The way that sir, FMD was I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Sir, yes? I... It, we're over two minutes, and I think we're having, um, at least okay, I'm having well, a, a one, one small difficult time. If you, if you one, could one wrap it up, and then also if you would put your comments in writing and please send it to the committee. But if you could wrap it up, please. Okay. Okay, just to, just to finish the thing very quickly. The metric uh, ability to put affiliation on the records you should ask the person whether that's nominated by the businesses, the licensees, or whether it's something that's inferred from the data, like the actual relationship between the licenses, because gaming that system introduces some wonderful opportunities for tax fraud. You know, just, it's just not that I'm going to say who's going to do it, but you're obviously sensitive to that possibility. I would ask that question, because my understanding is that that would be something that the licensees would have to declare that it was an affiliated or a non-affiliated transaction. I see problems with that. Thank you very much. Any questions you have, I can answer. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, BPS, are there any more, anyone else uh, on the phone in neutral? Chair, we have no more callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. Um, and if I could invite the presenters back up for any closing comments, if, if they'd like to make any. And they have waived that. Okay, um, and I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 430. Thank you. And then if I, um, if we can open it for public comments, please. The last thing on our agenda today, does anyone here in Carson City want to make a public comment? Seeing none, BPS, is there anyone on the phone lines for public comment? If you'd like to provide public comment, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers wishing to provide public comment at this time. Thank you, BPS, and that fulfills our agenda. Well, before that, we don't have a meeting for Thursday, right? There is no meeting on Thursday. Just wanted to confirm that. Um, otherwise, we are adjourned. It's this Thursday. This Thursday.